Welcome everybody to the Instituto Cervantes, Arracha León. Eh, buena tarde, buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Uh, welcome to this translating small literature in the British uh, Book Market Conference. Uh, it's a proud honor to, to meet uh, I'm Victor Ugarte, the director of the Instituto Cervantes in London. Uh, those here with us, uh, welcome also, especially uh, those involved in the issue of the Rivata dedicated to Spain. Uh, um, especially also uh, following us online, uh, welcome to. Uh, delighted to be hosting this event about translation that highlights the rich and diverse literary heritage of Spain in different languages, in the official languages in Spain. It is a pleasure for the Instituto Cervantes to be collaborating again with Olga Castro from the University of Warwick. Back in 2021, when Cervantes London hosted the, an online workshop that she organized about the translation of literatures in Basque, Catalan, and Galician, in which different British publishers and translation policy makers from the Echepare, the Llull, the Generalitat Valenciana, and the Junta de Galicia discussed internationalization strategies for the English translation in literatures in these languages, which can be watched online at that time. Today, the focus of the event is the translators. In many cases, real activists who, who are always eager to promote the different literatures and cultures abroad. In this case, uh, in the UK and more generally in the English language context. All these translators with us here today have also some pieces published in the magazine, the Spanish Riveta, I was mentioning. Uh, Rossi, thank you very much for this baby you, you get delivered. <laughs> yes, yeah. Rossi O'Donnell, thank you, the director. <laughs> Edited uh, by the European Literature Network, who uh, has also activi actively uh, participate in the organization of this event. And our translator, translators, We'll also have short videos published in the YouTube channel Translators Allowed. Hosting events like this is very important for the Instituto Cervantes London, and I am sure we will, we will all get new insights into translation from the discussions with experts in the initial roundtable, and we will already enjoy listening to the translators from Asturian, Basque, Catalan, Galician, and Spanish reading from the unpublished translations. Thanks again uh, very much. And I give the floor uh, to Katie Whitemore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Katie Whittemore. I am a translator from Spanish. And I was lucky enough to uh, work as the guest editor this year on the uh, on the Spanish Riveter. So I'm here in in both of those capacities, and we've been uh, working hard to get this event together. We have amazing guests uh, from whom we were we will all learn a lot, and I'd like to introduce them now in just a moment. But first. I want to thank everyone who's involved in this event. So, of course, to Instituto Cervantes for hosting us and for, for all of their support, uh, the European Literature Network and the Spanish Riveter, um, Olga Castro from the University of Warwick and Warwick Translates, um, as well as uh, the generous support of the, the Asturian regional government, the Principal de Asturias, who was um, is collaborating with, uh, with Robin Mumby, who we have um, as a translator on, on this afternoon's panel. Um, I also have to especially give a shout out to uh, Ainoa Sanchez, whom I will introduce momentarily, from Acción Cultural Española, who has also uh, been a, a great supporter of this event and other events related to the Spanish Riveter. Um, and Translators Aloud was, of course, mentioned, and Tina. And so we've got a full house of supporters and champions here. Um, uh, this is the first part of the event, as, as Victor mentioned. Um, this is a roundtable on changing the translation landscape um, in the UK specifically. That's where we are. Um, and uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, conversation and, and information from um, experts in translation and in um, promotion of international 
literature. We are particularly interested um, in the way uh, that Spain's cultural diplomacy initiatives may or may not be contributing to, uh, to the expansion of Spanish literature um, and literatures of multilingual Spain and the languages uh, that, that we are here to, to discuss. Um, we also will be pointing to opportunities for the British publishing market because all of this work is really wonderful in a philosophical way, but uh, it's also really, really important to know about the opportunities for actually making books um, and then actually getting those books into the hands of readers in English. So uh, there's really great uh, discussion around some of the, you know, some theoretical issues we'll get to, I'm sure, especially with the translators, but uh, part of this impetus really is about actually getting these books out into the world um, and getting international literature into the hands of a public, a reading public. So thank you for coming and for being part of it. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists. I'll introduce them um, all at once, and then we will hear from, from each of, of them individually for about 10 minutes. So first we have uh, to my right, Olga Castro. She is Associate Professor in Translation Studies at the University of Warwick where she is the program director of the MA in Translation and Cultures. Her main research interests include feminist translation studies from a transnational and intersectional perspective, the politics of translation in non-hegemonic cultures with a focus on the Anglo-American publishing market, and self-translation in multilingual contexts. She is currently principal investigator in the research project, Changing the tra Translation Landscape from Multilingual Spain, that sounds familiar, right? <laughs> Cultural diplomacy and the UK publishing industry, which is funded by the Arts and Humanities Impact Fund. She has co-edited the books, Translating Women in the Anglosphere, Activism in Action, Feminist Translation Studies, Local and Transnational Perspectives, Self-Translation and Power, Negotiating Identities in Multilingual European Contexts. She is a corresponding member of the Real Academia Gallega, and has recently been Vice President of the Association of Programs in Translation and Interpreting in the UK and Ireland. Thank you, Olga. Olga is also the, the, the principal organizer of, of this event. And, yes. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, we're going to go, if you don't mind, in order of how you will be speaking. So I'm going to come back to you, Tina, and I'm going to go to Ainoa Sanchez Mateo. Uh, from Acción Cultural Española. She has more than 20 years of experience in cultural management, first in the art world and since 2014 in the area of literature and books. She currently directs the literature and book department at Acción Cultural Española, ACE, a public entity dedicated to the promotion of Spain's culture and patrimony through a wide range of activities, including art exhibits, film, theater, music, audiovisual works and initiatives that support travel, for professionals and creatives. And I know this is something that I know we'll talk about uh, for all of us today. Among other responsibilities, she manages grant programs for translations, residencies, and the program for the internet internationalization of Spanish culture, which includes uh, two avenues of support, one aimed at supporting the mobility of Spanish cultural professionals abroad. So something like an event like today's, um, as well as bringing uh, international and foreign professionals and cultural programmers to Spain um, as well. And this, both lines of this program have uh, supported more than 800 professionals going and coming from Spain. Um, and then we have Tina Cover. We're going to go back to the left. And Tina is the translator of over 30 books from French. Her work has won the Albertine Prize, the French Voices Award, and the Lambda Literary Award, and she has been shortlisted for the U.S. National Book Award, the International Dublin Literary Award, the Penn Translation Prize, the Warwick Prize, oh gosh, I'm just tired thinking about it, <laughs> the Warwick Prize for Women in Translation, the Ox Oxford Wiedenfeld Prize, Translation Prize, and the Scott Moncrief Prize. Her translation of Anna of Anne Barres, Gungort Prize finalist, Family Saga, The Postcard, you might have seen this on social media, it's all the buzz right now, is forthcoming from Europa Editions in May 2023. Tina leads literary translation workshops for the American Literary Translators Association and masterclasses in literary translation for Durham University. 
She is also the co-founder of Translators Aloud, a YouTube channel that features literary translators reading from their, from their own work and in which capacity uh, she will speak to us today. And lastly, uh, my own fearless leader, Rosie Goldsmith, <laughs> who is an award-winning journalist specializing in arts and foreign affairs, a former uh, BBC staff broadcaster for 20 years. Rosie traveled the world, presented flagship programs such as Crossing Continents, A World in Your Ear, Open Book, and Front Row. She has interviewed leading cultural and literary figures, is a passionate linguist, French, German, and Italian, and has lived in Europe, Africa, and the USA. Today, she combines journalism with chairing and curating arts and literary events in the UK and across the world. She is founder and director of the European Literature Network, editor-in-chief of the Riveter Magazine, and was chair of the judges of the EBRD Literature Prize from 2018 to 2020. She is a regular chair at literature festivals, collaborates with major cultural organizations from museums to festivals to universities to the Instituto Cervantes. In addition to this month, <laughs> in addition to this month's launch of two editions of the Riveter dedicated to literature from Austria and Spain, she has been busy curating the inaugural European Writers Festival, which will celebrate the best European prose and poetry in English translation, which is set to take place at the British Library on May 20th and 21st of this year. So run out and get your tickets if they're available. <laughs> um, thank you all very much. And I will turn things over first to Olga. Thank you. And thank you everybody for coming here today. Um, so I have been working on um, translation in non-hegemonic contexts for a number of years now, uh, namely studying patterns of production, circulation and reception of Basque, Catalan and Galician literatures in the UK. So the literatures in the co-official languages of Spain. And I have only now incorporated Asturian as well, which is a non-official uh, language yet, which nevertheless has a rich uh, literary tradition, which also deserves uh, recognition and study. And um, well, Asturian is not the only non-official language in Spain that has a rich literary tradition. Also in the region of Asturian, we've got other uh, non-official languages such as uh, Galician Asturian, also known as Eo Naviego, but we could think of other languages as well, Aragonese, um, Amaziga. So my point is that multilingualism is an incontestable fact in, in the Spanish state in Spain today. And 45% uh, of the population in Spain lives in a territory where an autochthonous minority language is spoken according to the European Charter of Regional and Minority Languages published by the Council of Europe in 2019. So in my brief talk today, um, I want to discuss the rationale for my current project and also to state my aims and why discussions like this, I think, are so important to help promote um, the diversity of literatures from Spain. So it all started in 2017 when I got the British Academy grant for a project entitled Stateless Cultures in Translation, Basque, Catalan and Galician Literatures in the UK. And um, well, my point at, uh, uh, then was that in source language societies, translation is a cultural diplomacy tool for governments to promote their cultures and their literatures abroad. So I worked with translation policymakers from Catalonia and the Balearic Islands, from Valencia, from Galicia and the Basque Country, so the Jul, the Chepare, Junta de Galicia and Generalitat Valenciana, to examine the cultural diplomacy strategies that they put in place to try and disseminate their literatures abroad. So I'm uh, referring to translation grants, to other initiatives like um, grants for enabling encounters between um, foreign and local publishers, and also their participation in the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is the world's largest trade fair for, uh, for books, so the most important place to buy and sell translation rights. But obviously for translation to happen, translation rights have to be sold by whoever holds them. So normally that is the publishing house which first published the book in Basque, Catalan, Galician, or in some cases, literary agents. So in my project, I also worked with the publishers associations in these languages, 
studying the particularities of the different publishing industries. And whereas there is a very strong, and I would say even, well, professionalized publishing industry in Catalonia, in the case of Valencia, Galicia, and the Basque Country, publishers are often small independent presses with no much capacity for internationalization. Um, in fact, I found out that some publishers, knowing that they won't be able to do much with the translation rights, offer them to the authors themselves, which is in the, an, an, an act of goodwill, but completely undermines the translation process in the way that, well, authors are not really in a position to approach a foreign publisher and tell them, look, I've written a wonderful book, would you translate it? Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the knowledge about the target system to know which books could work well and um, or could or which books could fit in the publisher's collection and also they don't have the credibility all authors are going to say that their book is great um, so yeah that's that's a problem in a professional world um, so unless the associations and the publishers get special help uh, to um, inter internationalize their literary production in Basque Galician and to some extent uh, Catalan, because in that case they do get uh, uh, help, um, and, uh, and, and also help to professionalize their practices, it's going to be extremely difficult for them to sell the translation rights abroad. Um, and then the third group of stakeholders I worked with in my previous project was uh, British publishers the ones buying those translation rights, applying for grants, and publishing eventually the English uh, translation of um, literatures written in Catalan, Galician, and Basque. And we'll know that for decades, the Anglophone book market has been defined in terms of a very limited space for translated literature. However, and I'm not going to give any figures, uh, but uh, in recent times, the, situa the situation um, appears to be shifted, uh, shifting over with the number of publications uh, growing considerably. And there is also an increased openness towards translation, um, particularly, I would say, in relation to fiction from other European languages. Who knows if that's a result of, um, of Brexit? And in any case, the changes uh, um, uh, have also been influenced by the proliferation of new independent publishing houses in, in the UK and to some extent in the US as well, who are very keen to promote um, uh, translation. Um, so the results of that project have, um, have been published in, in different um, articles and government focused uh, reports, and they can be found on my um, pro um, uh, professional website, uh, Warwick University, but I realized when going through the findings that I had forgotten about two crucial aspects. One was the crucial role of translators in the process, mm -hmm. the ones having to do research about available grants to tell foreign publishers um, uh, about, about the books and to try and convince them with, you know, when pitching a translation, the ones sometimes applying for grants, the ones doing sub sample translations as well for free whenever you know, no grants are available, depending on the context. And the other aspect that was not covered in my previous project was that, um, well, there are also translation rights, uh, sorry, translation grants and um, from or at the state level. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is the translation grants by the Ministry of uh, Culture, the Spanish government Ministry of Culture, uh, explicitly include all official languages of Spain. Non, uh, in, in this case, Asturian is not included, but all the others are. Um, so I looked at those grants too, and what I found out was, this, was that publishers interested in translating Basque, Catalan and Galician were engaging almost exclusively with the regional policy making institutions and I wanted to know why, why is it that they are not applying to the Spanish state uh, um, uh, grants, translation grants. So that led to my current uh, project and I will summarize it in two minutes. <laughs> um, the title is, yeah, as, as Katie said, Changing the Translation Landscape from Multilingual Spain, Cultural Diplomacy and the UK uh, Publishing Industry. And here, my main non-academic partners are the Instituto Cervantes and the Spanish Director General of Books and Promotion of Reading, Dirección General del Libro y Promoción de la Lectura. 
it was a very timely project, bearing in mind that Spain was guest of honor in 2022 at the strategically important Frankfurt Book Fair. And that fair was seen by the Spanish government as a crucial opportunity to display Spain's multilingualism and its diverse literary heritage. And indeed, bibliodiversity and linguistic plurality was one of the five strategic pillars of the Spanish Guest of Honor 2022 project, Spilling Creativity, Creatividad Desbordante. So they were highlighting, and I quote, Spain is synonymous with diversity. In the Spanish territory, there are a variety of cultures and languages that enrich the literary offer. A similar message was disseminated in the video campaign, uh, hashtag Camino a Frankfurt, so literally on our way to Frankfurt, which explicitly mentions that 24% of the Spanish literary publishing industry and 25 sorry, 24% of the Spanish literary publishing industry and 25% of the Spanish authors write in languages other than Spanish. So what I wanted to find out is how multilingualism may shape or not Spain's cultural diplomacy um, strategies. So I wanted to look at how multilingualism is being branded and promoted internationally by the Ministry of Culture to enlarge the understanding of Spain's linguistic and literary diversity abroad and also how that 24% of literary projects in languages other than Spanish are reflected on initiatives put in place in preparation for and during and in the aftermath of the Frankfurt Book Fair. So my results are still very provisional, but I have found out that um, the trend I had previously identified, so uh, publishers, foreign publishers interest, interested in translating from Basque, Catalan and Galician, do not really start applying for the Ministry, Ministry of Culture grants. And that also happens to some extent regarding the newly open calls for translation grants introduced in 2019, 2020 and 2021 by the public agency Acción Cultural Española. And I know I is gonna tell us more about that and also about the current uh, call, uh, which is yeah, open aimed at orchestrating the promotion of Spain's rich and plural artistic legacy. Um, so um, with very few, um, uh, right, okay. So then I studied the online translation rights catalog books from Spain hosted at the Frankfurt Rights website, which was purposely created uh, for Spain Guest of Honor 2022 by the Spanish Ministry of Culture, Acción Cultural Española, and the Spanish Federation of Publishers Guilds, Federación Española de Gremios, um, Editoriales. And um, well, the purpose of this translation right catalog is precisely to attract foreign publishers' attention towards Spain's literary production. So to my surprise, books in Catalan and most especially uh, books in Basque and Galician are almost non-existent in that catalog, um, which means that literatures in non-official, uh, in, uh, well, in, in um, co-official languages remain um, uh, or, or get a very limited visibility there. And then of course, uh, literatures in non-official languages like Asturian have no visibility. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand now why there is this mismatch, perhaps, between uh, the way that diversity is uh, explained and how important it is, and why, in practice, this is not materialized in actual and concrete uh, strategies. And the point that I'm, I'm trying to make is that positive action initiatives are um, absolutely necessary if we are serious about um, presenting and show, uh, showcasing this, uh, this diversity in the Spanish uh, literary um, uh, landscape. And events like the one we are having today will hopefully uh, help as well. So I will now uh, leave the floor to Ainoa, who's gonna tell us more about the cultural diplomacy strategies put in place by Acción Cultural Española. Well, you just blew my mind. I don't know what to say after this, but I'll, I'll try. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the organizers for inviting us to be part of this event and uh, to 
also invite us to try to explain a little bit of who we are, what we do, and also what we can do for you, obviously. Um, well, so just very, very briefly, because I think we are... We start a bit late. So do we start a bit late. Okay, so I have... <laughs> We are, uh, Acción Cultural Española is the state agency that orchestrates the public support for the promotion of culture, um, of the cultural promotion, both uh, within Spain and outside our country. And we do this through a wide uh, range of activities that include uh, organizing the representation of Spain in uh, world or universal expos or in specific uh, cultural events such as the exp um, Frankfurt Book Fair when we were um, guest of honor or doing exhibitions, commemorations, artistic residencies, et cetera, et cetera. And also the program for the internationalization of Spanish culture, which is impossible to pronounce. And <laughs> so we call it PIFE, and, um, which I hope I have at least 50 seconds to talk to you about. And we also have the translation grants uh, program, which we uh, put up in place in 2019 uh, when we learned that we, Spain was going to be a guest of honor in 2022. And just uh, before I go into detail with that uh, program, I just want to make a very small overview of the Spanish public uh, sector, which is uh, I would say the strongest cultural industry in Spain, it accounts to 0.9 of our GDP, which is quite uh, good. And it's very rich and diverse. Uh, we have over, we publish around 80,000 titles per year in paper and around or between 16 to 20% of those titles, depending on the year, are translations from other pro, uh, languages. So we are an open market. We're interested in other cultures. We are eager to know about other uh, people and other uh, situations. And also, as Olga mentioned before, um, 20, uh, my, my number said 23, but your number said 24. So 24% of those uh, uh, books are also written in languages different than uh, Castilian Spanish. So that's a very, very wide and rich uh, heritage that we have to take care of. Uh, we also have around 800 uh, publishing houses, which some of which uh, belong to the biggest uh, publishing groups in the world, huge groups. And But we also have a huge myriad of very tiny and small uh, publishing houses that are doing an incredible job and that also need uh, public support and that I think are very related to your studies, but this is maybe something we will go over after. So uh, as Olga mentioned, there's uh, the Ministry of Culture put up in uh, in the 80s, I believe, a program translation grant system that allows translation between all the languages in Spain, because as Olga mentioned, there, Castilian Spanish is not our only official language. Um, and also covers translation from any of official languages of Spain to any uh, language in the world, which is, I mean, it covers the whole spectrum, basically. But there are also the um, uh, grant systems that are were put in, uh, in place by other institutions, such as La Junta de Galicia, Instituto Vasco Echepare, and Instituto Ramon Yul, of course, and some of which are complemented by diverse uh, programs that work very well, especially the ones that I, I must say I'm very, uh, <laughs> I, you do it very well. You have uh, the fellowships for editors, which are great. You have also literature, promotion literature. You have, you do samples and you do residencies for translators, which is amazing because you cover the whole spectrum. But we do too. So <laughs> I, I, I'm here to say this, and, um, and I'd like to share it with you. So we created this uh, grants in 2019. The uh, purpose was obvious to increase the visibility of our literature abroad and to encourage and support the translation of works, classic and contemporary. And we too were interested in covering all, like, all official languages in Spain, I must say. 
So what we did was created uh, four lines of support. One was uh, for Spanish agents and publishers so that they could do uh, samples and then go to different fairs and sell the rights. And the other three, which are translation of a complete work, translation of anthologies and support for the illustration of translated works are destined to foreign publishers. Since these grants were created uh, in the framework of the Frankfurt Book Fair, uh, we decided that we will focus only in five uh, languages that were the most important ones for the German market. So that's why we only cover German, English, French, Italian, and Dutch. And so the works that you submit must be written in any of Spain's official languages, must have been previously, and I previously uh, published by a Spanish um, publishing house uh, in paper and with physical distribution in bookstores, that's important too. The author must be a European community citizen or a legal resident in Spain. And we cover basically any genre, except for, I don't know, uh, university, uh, uh, merchandising. We don't cover that. But besides that, we cover everything. The allowable expenses were, are the translator fees in, uh, in all the lands, except for the illustration land, which only covers the illustration fees. Uh, you can, I mean, a publishing house can ask for, can request two, um, can send two applications for each of the line. And we can cover up to uh, the 100% 100, 100 of the cost, although you get, I mean, you get a number of points and you get a correlated uh, support. And the maximum grant you can get is 15,000 euros per book. One, other important thing is that you can combine this grant with any other grant as long as adding the all the subsidies and grants you don't surpass the 100% of the cost obviously so it is open right now i don't know who any of you are editors here but we are receiving applications right now and we will be receiving applications until the end of october and the process is quite quick i mean you will get the results by late December, hopefully. And after you get the results, you have 18 months to publish the book. So I think it's quite uh, enough time. And I want to stress out that the whole idea of putting out this uh, new set of grants was to have a very accessible, very, very accessible and simple uh, system of grants. So all the information is available in English and Spanish. You, uh, it's an online application. You can get in and go out as many times as you want, as long as you don't send the application. So you save it and go back as many times as you want. You, the, the documents you need to send are quite simple and you can send them both in Spanish or English. If you have a document that's say in Dutch and you need to attach it to the application, you can do your own translation. It doesn't have to be an official translation. It doesn't have to be a sealed translation. Obviously, you will be held accountable of the veracity of, of the <laughs> translation, but you don't need uh, to have anything um, more than that. So it's really, really simple. I mean, you could do the whole process in a couple hours, maybe. I don't know. Some of you here have done it before. Maybe we can give you, give us your input on that. So between 2019 and 2022, uh, just take into account that we the results for the 2022 are not out yet. So this will in increase pretty soon. We have uh, granted the translation of over 600 samples and 300 books, which is not bad. Um, we're pretty happy with the results. And into English, we have uh, managed to get 63 translations, which we are very happy about, but only five uh, direct translations from uh, languages that are not Castilian Spanish into other languages. And to be honest, we don't know why, because um, 
it's there. You can ask for it, but nobody requests that. So I would really, really, really like if someone gives me some insight on that. Um, German, I think I'm running out of time. So German was the first language, Italian, English in third place, French and Dutch, and way, way, way above uh, all the rest, uh, narrative was the on, on top one, and then poetry, and then the rest of the genres were um, a little bit below. But before I, 20 seconds, uh, our mobility grant and our PT grant are very important because once you publish the book, you can also request a mobility grant. So you imagine you publish the book and you want to make a promotional tool for your author. So you could request a, a PT grant, which is open all year round, and you could do a tour for your author. Even if your author uh, has an old book, you still can do this. I mean, it doesn't have to be a recent book or it doesn't have to be, you, you can do it anytime. It doesn't have to be any of those five languages. It can be any language. It doesn't have to be a book. You can just uh, have your author participate in an event or a festival or whatever. So that's also very useful information. And we also have residencies for translators right now only in German, but we're working on other uh, languages. We also have uh, the visitors programs, which will allow us to bring international prescriptors such as editors, translators, or publishers, or festival programmers to Spain so they can get a first-hand knowledge on what's happening and which authors are working well, etc. And I'm pretty sure we'll continue the discussion Thank you. I think I'm uh, probably the only person in the room who doesn't uh, speak Spanish. So thanks for allowing me to gate crash. <laughs> What's that? Oh, right. Okay. God, I'm not the only one. It's all right then. Um, right. So I'll just start my timer here. Um, so I'm here. Um, I'm a translator myself, um, but I'm here representing uh, translators aloud, uh, which if you haven't heard of us, um, is a YouTube channel that we started um, in May 2020 during uh, lock, the first lockdown. Um, so maybe I'll sort of imitate what I know I has done and like tell you a little bit about our channel and then how we can, you know, potentially and how we hope to help uh, promote uh, translations from Spain um, and all of the, the languages. <clears throat> Uh, so, as I said, it was lockdown, and um, I, as a translator, was kind of um, sort of going stir crazy at home and thinking about, you know, my work. And we all work in isolation generally as literary translators, but this was, um, you know, taking it to a bit of an extreme. So I thought, you know, I wonder if I were to record myself reading a little excerpt from one of my own translations, if anybody would be interested in watching that and so I put out a tweet um, just asking that question and the response we got was actually quite overwhelming um, not just from people saying yes I'd love to see that but from other translators saying um, you know I've always I've often wondered the same thing uh, not only have I you know sort of wanted to put myself out there more publicly but I'd love to hear other translators um, you know um, Kind of reading their work and 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 you know uh, get exposure to the broader community that way. Um, and so my my co-founder of the channel, um, Charlotte Coombe, who is also a literary translator from French and Spanish, basically said, "Well, let's start let's start a YouTube channel." Um, and so we by the end of the day, um, the channel existed. Um, so that was May 2020. We now have. Uh, over 400 videos up on the channel. Um, that's 300 plus translators who have done readings for us. We've got close to 50 languages. 
uh, represented um, almost 2,000 subscribers on YouTube and over 100,000 separate views of the channel. So there's we've been really gratified by the reception that we've you know that we've gotten, um, and uh, we were and remain shocked that nothing like this like this existed before. Um, you know, there was just absolutely nowhere people could go to kind of, um, you know, get a get a taste of of literary translation. Um, and um, it was it will I say we were shocked, but in a way it's really not shocking because uh, this is part of the problem that we're constantly battling, which is um, lack of visibility among uh, uh, translators and and lack of visibility of literary translation. Um, uh, I think I heard a figure something like 16 or 17 percent of the books published in Spain are from other languages. I mean, we all know the famous figure of three percent, right, um, translated into English. And I think the number has risen a little bit, but it's still, you know, just shockingly low. Um, and so part of that uh, you know, the effort to um, attract attention to literary translation and the incredible wealth of books that are published um, in languages other than English. Um, uh, part of the part of the, uh, the the way to attract attention to that is to attract attention to the people who do the work. Um, you know, because it's a bunch of incredibly talented craftsmen, I think in a very, you know, unappreciated or underappreciated, um, you know, artistic sphere, but we are very much writers, we are very much, um, you know, creative artists in our own right. Um, and I think in the same sense that, you know, you go and see an author give a talk, and then their writing has a more personal aspect to you after that, because you've seen them and you've heard them speak and you've gotten a feeling for how much they love their work. It's the same with translators. Uh, you know, nobody um, is going to be a more sort of enthusiastic reader um, uh, allowed of, of, of a translation than the person who did the work, you know. Um, so that's what we do. Um, we, um, we publish, uh, it was two new readings a week. Um, it's now one reading um, most of the time, but you know, we, obviously we, we're always happy to publish more. We, we do feature weeks um, with, um, uh, uh, there have been a, a range of organizations, New Books in German, the Yiddish Book Center. Um, we've done feature weeks um, for, uh, um, Pub specific publishers who've come to us and said, well, I, you know, I've got, I've got seven books in translation, you know, coming out and I want all, all seven of those translators to do a reading for you. Um, obviously we don't, we don't charge anything for this. I mean, this it's, it's, it's our privilege really to kind of help, um, you know, get uh, literary translation um, out in the public sphere. And if, uh, You'll see I've put some flyers around. I didn't have enough, but if if you if you don't know about us, if you're not subscribed to our channel yet, please come, you know, and subscribe. Um, uh, it's a uh, it's an absolutely great way to get a taste um, of a lot of different um, we languages, different genres. If you're looking for your next read, um, you know, it's a great place to kind of yeah sample what's out there. Um, uh, and one of our big um, aims, I should say, uh, as part of this effort to increase translator visibility um, is also to increase the visibility of the lesser known, for lack of a better term, languages. And so that's where, um, you know, all the different um, non-Castilian Spanish languages have come in. And all of the translators um, that are reading for us today have also recorded themselves doing their readings and sent them to us. And so next week is going to be a feature week. So if you, uh, you know, if you want to see them again, if you want to spread the word, you can come to our channel, um, you know, and, um, and see the readings all over again next week.
Um, <clears throat> another thing that we do um, is, uh, and we are a very, obviously we're a very young sort of endeavor. Um, we, we didn't necessarily expect to be this successful. So it's just the two of us, myself and, and Charlotte Coombe running this channel. Um, but we're hoping to um, support literary translation, particularly among lesser known languages um, in concrete financial ways as well. Um, we have merchandise that we sell, um, you know, t-shirts and mugs and coasters and all of that is available on our website, which is just translatorsallowed.com. All of that fund funding goes to um, uh, a bursary, um, it's the Translators Allowed Bursary um, for the uh, BCLT Literary Translation Summer School every year. Um, and it's for full participation for a, a translator, a non-white translator, basically. So the recipient of our initial bursary last year was a translator from the Burmese. Um, so it was a, not, not only a non-white translator, but a translator from you know, a very underrepresented language. Um, I'm already at nine minutes, which is shocking, actually. Um, <laughs> but as I said, this is only the beginning, uh, you know, for us. We we are unfunded, but we're at, at the moment, but we're hoping sort of to increase uh, the amount that we're able to give back. Um, so if, if if anybody wants to come to me with ideas for how we can, you know, get a little more money in the coffers today, that would always be. Um, appreciated, but you know we we do see it absolutely as our privilege uh, to be kind of part of the you know fighting the good fight to um, you know uh, help the rest of the world see what kind of extraordinary and exquisite um, literature is being published um, around the world in the, in the lesser known languages. So that's my time. Thanks very much. Right, so, move things around a little bit. Um, thank you, Katie, for the previous introduction. So I'm Rosie, and I'm going to talk about um, the European Literature Network, which, like translators allowed, actually grew out of a necessity. It was just there, and it needed to happen. And I had just left the BBC, and I'd gone on a wonderful trip, one of those wonderful trips organised by the EU, as an editor and a, um, a journalist to Brussels. And I went to the European Union Prize for Literature Prize giving, it was wonderful. And there were 20 journalists from the UK who went over. And then when we got back, I said, what happens now? And, um, and they, they all said, oh, well, we just, you know, we might write something about it, we might not. And I said, well, this is happening and we're not really part of it. And the very first thing that people said to me when I was in Brussels, they said, nobody in the UK is really interested in what we're doing. And we don't have, we don't have many people in the UK who are even trying to promote European literature, um, let alone translation and languages. And so um, I hadn't been very long, I hadn't left the BBC that long before then. And um, as my dear colleagues here who know me well know, that I do like to grab the bull by the horns and make things happen. And within a few weeks, we had got meetings of all the different cultural organisations in London at that stage, British Council, Arts Council, UNIC, every, well, UNIC didn't exist as such then, but they all came together. I mean, we were at one point in Europe House, which you all know as a great um, vestige, a vessel of European culture in this country um, and politics at one point. Um, it that became our home, and we had one at one point we had a meeting of 120 people, and then we applied for an arts council grant, and um, we got that, and then we um, started branching out, and people were coming to these meetings very regularly, and then we got a Creative Europe funding grant for four four years as well, and um, you know I travelled quite a lot, quite involved in festivals. I, mean, I, I was already chairing events at festivals and things as journalists, but I got quite involved in festivals in the rest of Europe and beyond talking about European literature. Um, and then 
Um, so it just grew and grew, and we were able to just about keep going financially, but we weren't doing this in the same way as Tina. You know, we were sort of like 10 years, we are 10 years ahead of you. Um, hopefully you'll have more success with funding than we have. But, um, um, we got to the point where, you know, we were really riding high. And we started the magazine in 2017, the Riveter magazine. And my nickname had always been Rosie the Riveter. I'm sure you know where that comes from. And, um, and so the magazine uh, became the Riveter. It just made sense. Everything we did had that name attached to it. Yeah, and you know what riveting means. It's a very difficult word to translate, by the way. Um, but, you know, it's about getting things done. And it's about, um, it's about making all the translations and all the books and everything that we care about. Um, it's about getting it out there. And anyway, just to finish the funding story, which is the least interesting for all of you, but probably the most interesting for all of us, is that um, in the lockdown, we put... We'd, we'd applied for um, a really major funding grant. And at that point, the Arts Council closed down all the grant applications. And so we were destitute, really. We spent four months applying for this. And uh, so we didn't receive an Arts Council grant and also Creative Europe. Guess what? Because of Brexit, <laughs> it suddenly we didn't, we weren't, we weren't able to apply for that. So um, anyway, we tried so many different avenues but then decided we would just keep going with the magazines. You know, we weren't going to stop just because we didn't have any money. So um, <laughs> that little old thing, who needs money? Anyway, so what I decided to do was then to apply for each individual magazine and to try to make this European connection continue with, through, with, through the magazines. And each magazine has had its own challenges as far as funding, funding goes. Um, we're on the... Spanish magazine is the 12th edition and as many of our sponsors and colleagues here in this room and uh, I won't name you all because there are there are six separate Spanish um, funders for this magazine um, and each each one we love you dearly equally <laughs> um, and but it is it is a big group of people and so it took a long time to raise the funding for this I never thought I was that kind of person who was a fundraiser but that's what I've become and um, but it works and these two magazines this time, the um, Austrian and the Spanish, are, I couldn't have wished for better magazines. Um, we've, we've got a launch next Tuesday at the British Library if you want to come. But I'm gonna tell you why I think it works and what is behind all of this in the short time I've got left to me, because, and this is echoing what you are all saying from the very beginning when Olga said this, that what is the point of publishing a book or translating a book if no one reads it? Um, so the whole ethos behind the European Literature Network is about popularizing and promoting literature in translation. And as a journalist, as somebody who had a public has a public platform, somebody who is pretty well connected, um, I all I wanted to do is to share that. And um, and I just found uh, there were very few people doing this. There are lots of champions of various aspects of this field, but and the champions are becoming more and many, thank goodness. But there really wasn't anybody organizing this. So um, that's what I started to do. And in those early days, there was money, so it was much easier. Um, but it was quite shocking to me that this very single fact of promotion and legacy and what comes after um, a book has been published was ignored. And um, so you know, in order to achieve that, what I started to think about was, we've got nothing to lose. Let's just try everything. So, you know, understand and research your target country is always very, very important. You know, find out the influencers and the champions and always latch onto them, become, uh, you know, like Tina and I know each other now and Olga and I know each other. I know and I know each other. We, you know, I know lots of you in this room because of what we do and because we actually like working with one another that's a really important point work with people you like really really good tip that <laughs> um and networks and communities you know sort of make sure that you nurture those networks and communities this is a terribly difficult market this five percent that we're talking about we're a very small group of people um but we we have loud voices and i think translators allowed is also about having a loud voice you know it's not just about the fact that it's a small group of people who care about translation. I know you care about, you know, the afterlife of that as well. Um, 
also think always when you're marketing and think, think about the topical pegs. The reason we wanted to do a Spanish Riveter was because, partly because of Frankfurt Book Fair. Um, Frankfurt Book Fair was much more aimed at the European and German markets. So we thought English, you know, it's almost like a no brainer. So I call it the zeitgeist, you know, smelling the zeitgeist really. Um, the multi-platform approach has been very important for us since the very beginning. And that was because I was a journalist. And basically we have, we do have a YouTube channel. We don't use it very much now, but a few years ago we were doing the whole series of riveting interviews, um, riveting reviews. We still continue those, but again, it's really difficult without any funding whatsoever. Um, but, you know, we were being sent books. We are being sent books by publishers and, and Wes is our editor for the reviews. But, you know, we, we, we are trying to keep that going because as everybody always says, there aren't enough reviews of translated literature. We would love to keep that going. Um, and podcasts, we do all those, you know, artwork, visuals. How important is it to have such, you know, that's a beautiful cover. Um, and people come up to us and they say, oh, it's just gorgeous. You know, I want, want the dress material in that. Well, that's what I say. <laughs> Nobody else says that. <laughs> but, you know, there is that kind of thing. We've only ever done one bit of merchandise, Tina will be disappointed to know, and that was a, a, a tote bag um with the italians but so yeah and then we sort of try to make notes we have we run a website and we put loads of stuff on there it's free for anybody to use everything we do is for free um everything and if people want to publish a short story a poem we have you know regular poetry um poetry travels we have blogs we have all kinds of things and i would do much much more if it were possible to professionalize what we do we are professionals, but it's not paid mm -hmm. anything. So that's that. Apply for prizes, festivals, go on these editors' trips, residencies, meet people. And then mainly, I just want to finish by saying um, context. You know, you focus on the translations and the academic work. I focus on the context of all of it. It's about seeing what the culture of a country offers. It's about seeing literature in the context of the arts of the country, the politics of the country, the politics of Europe. There's no way, you know, we just don't barge in and assume we know everything. There's an incredible amount of research and reading and talking that goes on behind this. But the main, the main thing I want to say is that um, I think that the main message is that if promotion and this mobility that I know is talking about becomes part of the book package, then we all win. You know, and I, I assume and assure you possibly even that that percentage would go up to 10% in no time. It's, it's about, it's not just about publishing the book. It really isn't. Anyway, as, you, as everybody knows me knows, I, they, I could go on forever. <laughs> I won't. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, we could take them from the room and then where is Esteban? There you are. And you'll let me know if we have anything from online. Okay. Um, do we have any questions for any of our panelists? Yes? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there was 45% of people that live in Spain in a region that has um, uh, more than one language. But how many people actually speak? You know, like how many people are bilingual in Spain or, a, you know, for English or a regional language? Right. That document that I mentioned, the, let me um, quote it correctly. It was published by the European Council, the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages. So it's uh, available online. It was published in 2019, has all the figures. I okay. don't remember them. <laughs> I, can, I can point you in the right direction if you can't find it, but it's online. I also wanted to ask, what is, uh, if you know, what is the exact status of the co-official languages in Spain? Like, mm -hmm. what's their, you know, because like you'd say, like, they're only co-official in the regions, right? No, not, they, are, they are. They are. I think they're official in in, in the whole of the in the whole of the of the state. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so um, the term co-official is actually a bit problematic, and more recently, um, the term official has been um, applied just to mean that they all have uh, equal status. Yeah, okay. um, yeah legally. Okay. 
I've got a couple of quick points. One is B. Rosa. River Trend Busk is Erra Machagaiwa. Oh. You wouldn't have been worrying about that. Most people have. <laughs> That's amazing. And I know your thing about uh, 60 books published from the Spanish state, and only five of them from non Castilian languages. I think the explanation is really simple. Uh, for most uh, minority uh, language publishers, it's a, it's a labor of love. There's not much money around, and there's never going to be much money around. So that all the editors I know do it after they've done their day job. They do it at night, almost all of them. So even if you say we'll pay 100% of your costs, they don't have another, uh, they don't have 48 hours a day. I think that's it. So I don't know what the solution is. <laughs> but that's the problem, I think. However, there are small yeah. presses who publish in Spanish who do apply. Um, so I think it's, I totally agree with your point, but it's perhaps a little bit more complex. They will perhaps be the weather, weather prophets of the future. <laughs> we'll see. Superman. But uh, I think you're right. I think it's, it's actually a matter of resource. That's, um, and that, I'm sorry, that, that takes me back to books on Spain because um, when you were saying, oh, it was not represented, there were no, no, I know how it went because mm -hmm. we, uh, we launched the announcement of books in Spain and everybody could just go and sign. <laughs> it, no matter if you were big, small, huge, anyone. It was just in order of um, when you presented your mm -hmm. application and it was only, 100 spaces. We sent five books, but only 100 spaces. Number one, number one, number two. What happens? The ones that don't have resources had to wait until they, it was at night, and then they came in and they opened a, a space in Tokyo. And mm -hmm. big uh, publishing houses, mm -hmm. people that are working and then know when their grants are out and when they're not. And so it's I mean, it's resources, mm. but it's it's resources for everyone. I mean, for, for me too. I I too work at night, and I don't know, and we all do, and we. So it's um. So I think it's also a matter of, of having if of having the administration's these resources, and, and but I don't know if there's enough uh, money or interest or whatever to have those resources out. You say 100% and that's fantastic, but I don't think even that covers it because... No, you say uh, it's impossible, but, but that, that was our resources. I, I know. So our resources cover 100. And it's fantastic, <laughs> but I think the thing is that uh, it's also a book, any book has to be minimally profitable, um, apart from the money given by the public administration, for yeah, the resources to be sufficient for it to be not just the cost of that project, but also taking more people on or putting extra weekends in or so that's 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 what I think happens anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree with uh, with your view, I know, which is why uh, the final point I kind of made is unless positive action initiatives are put in place, it's really, really difficult. Uh, because the starting point for these publishers is is very uh, different as well. So they really never get to the same uh, exposure and level and yeah I'm, I'm um, thinking about that idea mm -hmm. but then again um, like for the samples line I mean you, you just you just have to send the application there's nothing involved you don't have to pay anything in advance you don't know just we do have to put a, some hours of work <laughs> on the application yeah. that's okay but why I'm, I'm surprised there's no more, um, we don't receive more applications from, from those of the languages do, which don't have yeah. much more options. No? So the translators <laughs> here did apply. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, I mean, the Catalan case is, uh, is different because the EU does offer um, yeah, uh, grants for samples. Mm -hmm. But in the case of uh, the Xunga de Galicia, it's an, and the Etepare, I'm unsure. Uh, yes, they, do. they do now, yes. not a couple of years ago. I think they've recently introduced them. So for uh, Galicia, for example, what Athe did was uh, amazing because many, not many, but some of them could apply for that grant that was not available to them before. 
Yeah. yeah, and then the point that Rossi was making about the promotion, once the once the translation exists, somebody has to read it for the book to, yeah. to, to make sense, I mean, for the translation process to make sense. So it's very important as well to yeah. have those mobility yeah. events that you yeah. mentioned so that the translated books can be promoted. And again, um, if for some of the languages, you know, with Afe offers is the only opportunity they have to do that. I think it's also about you know, how we get that information out, you know, where where we place that information, because I was really excited hearing from all of you what you actually do and what's already existing. Mm -hmm. And it's, I just don't think it was a little bit like the Arts Council, um, one of the panels we had at London Book Fair. People just didn't realise they could apply for these things. And that was the Arts Council in England. And you think that, goodness, you know, why are these messages not getting out? But I fully sympathise with this idea of you know, if we never cover up 100% of your professional costs and so on. But I, don't, I think we're all in a very difficult financial situation. Mm -hmm. And we can't earn a living from doing what we do. Um, and we all work at night to, to make these things happen. But I think it's partly the time we're living. But um, yeah, we're all trying very hard to make it work. I think. You know, so we, we don't have to sort of live in. I'm sure that we don't live in poverty, but you know, we don't have to actually, you know, struggle too much. It would really be nice, for example, to have like one one page in which someone from outside could find all the different grants, you know, mm -hmm. from yeah. uh you, La Shunta, uh, we, we have you know, you know that you know it that would be it. nice, you know, yeah. because someone from outside it's I mean it's hard for us. Unix should do that. Unix has that. Um, like a lit, like a clearinghouse. There is the yeah. literary database extraordinaire. Yeah. I don't know if you all know about it, but it's just a Google Doc mm -hmm. that Charlotte Kuhn, my partner, put together. Um, they actually, uh, it's crowdsourced, so it's constantly being updated. And they do mention sort of funding opportunities, mm -hmm. um, you know, publishers who, who, who publish translations. But, I mean, there are the risks for it again. There's, there's actually, um, there's actually uh, exists in on the unit. Not people don't go to the unit website. Yes. Like, that's the problem. Hmm. There is, um, because I think it's unit is the, you know, and that was always the uh, kind of approach we had to the EU before. And look what's happened. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we've we've completely missed, missed the trick. But um, but the but there is a map, which I was shown this week for the first time. It has a map of all the different funding bodies all over. Mm. And links, so it exists. It's, you know, we need to pull now after this. The legacy of something like this needs to be that we um, find. So we we basically um, guarantee that we will take this information and we're going to put it on our website anyway. Mm -hmm. And we keep this kind of networking. Yes. Okay. I think we have to stop our discussion uh, for this portion of today's event. Um, Olga, this is as far as my knowledge goes to for what happens next. <laughs> so I would like to invite you to come and tell everyone what's happening. Um, so you think we need a five minute break before the before the meetings or yeah, five probably, minutes? Yeah, five? at least five. Five, five minutes? Five to seven. Okay, so we're going to start with the <laughs> five to seven minutes thing, and then we'll have uh, the reading. And I'll just know there are... So yeah, welcome again to um, to the second part of this um, event. So in the next two hours, we're going to have five wonderful translate translators reading uh, their unpublished English translations from Asturian, Basque, Catalan, Galician, and Spanish in alphabetical order. That's why we've gone for that um, for um, for that uh, uh, list. Um, so they will have 20 minutes each and they will talk about the relationship to the texts that they are going to translate. They may tell us as well what is going to come out next week in the YouTube channel Translators Allowed. They could tell us about, I don't know, the challenges of translating in the different um, language combinations, um, whichever they want. And then they will also read, as I said, um, some translations that they've done and they haven't published yet. They are uh, Robin Mambi um, with Asturian, Aritz Bra uh, Branton with Basque, Mara Faye Lidham with Catalan, 
Jacob Rogers with Galician and Katie Whittemore with Spanish. Um, so I think it's, it's already been said, but all of them have contributed to the magazine, The Spanish Riveter. So you will uh, be able to read some of their translations or other kind of uh, contributions there. And um, yeah, I wanted to, to say that Translators Allowed to have a website as well now, Tina mentioned that, and the, um, the readings uh, will be uh, tweeted. So if you're not following uh, Translators Allowed on Twitter, do so. Uh, the handle is uh, Loud Translators. So please do that. So you will see the tweets next week for, from, from Monday to Friday, when translator per day. And that will be available in the Seeker, a publisher playlist. So to try and find publishers for these wonderful uh, uh, translations. Um, and uh, well, one thing I have to mention as well is that because this event is also related to um, a research project at my university in, in Warwick, I would be really, really grateful if after the event, you could um, complete the survey that you will have found on your chair. And it's also available online and the, the link and the QR code was um, being shown before. Right, I will now hand over to the, uh, to the translators. Um, so Robbie, I I'm gonna introduce you now and then you can just um, uh, talk one after the, the next. So um, Asturian, that's Robin Mambi, as I said before. He is a literary translator from Liverpool. He is based in Madrid and he translates from Russian, Spanish, and more recently Asturian. And his translations have appeared in publications including Asymptote, Asymptote sorry, World Literature Today, the Cambridge Literary Review, the Glasgow Review of Books, among many others. And you can... Um, complete anything that I've missed from, <laughs> from this brief introduction, Robin. Basque, that's Aritz Branton. He was born in the UK, but he has spent the last 20 years in the Basque country. Um, his translations from Basque into English include Martutene by Ramon Cesar Vitoria and short stories by Eder Rodriguez, Carmel Jayo, and Katisha Aguirre. Aritz uh, works in, in, in production at buttegi.com. EUS, uh, with the Spanish, EUS, EUS. EUS, that's it, yeah, so booktaggy.eus, um, a project in support of Basque uh, literature, which offers ebooks, audiobooks, and videos free of charge. With Catalan, we've got Mara Faye Lism, uh, she is a translator of Catalan and Spanish fiction, her translate, translations have recently been recognized with the inaugural Spain US Foundation Translation Award. And she was also awarded the two, uh, sorry, uh, 2022 uh, Tendros International Prize for her contribution to Catalan literature. Um, her translation of uh, Irene Sula, When I Sing, Mountains Dance, is a finalist for the 200, sorry, 2022 National Book Critics Circle Greg Barrios Translation Prize. Why do they have this very long title? <laughs> um, and her translation of Paul Wash, uh, Nepal in the Heart is forthcoming uh, from Faber and Faber uh, uh, in the next few months. Uh, I'm not sure. Right, <laughs> soon. Okay soon is for coming yeah i should have stopped there <laughs> galician that's jacob rogers uh, he's a translator of galician and spanish he has also been awarded grants i told you we've uh, got a great panel so he's uh, he's been awarded grants from the national endowment for the arts and pan america his translation of manuel rivas the last days of terra nova was published by archipelago books in 2022 and his translation of berta davila loved ones will be published by three times rebel this summer i got this right yeah this summer june, june. okay so this early summer <laughs> and spanish um katie whittemore she lives in valencia she translates contemporary uh, literary fiction from spanish and she served as guest editor for the rebel magazine's uh, 12th issue the one that we've um, we've seen today um, her published translations include novels by Sara Mesa, John Bilbao, Lara Moreno, Nuria Lavari, Aroa Moreno Durán, Katisha Aguirre as well, uh, Javier Serena and Almudena Sánchez. 
And her translation of Not Even the Dead by Juan Gomez Barcena is forthcoming uh, from Open Letter Books this summer. <laughs> right, so you were sure, yeah. And something, yeah, I, I didn't mention, yeah, is that we've got some uh, books, translations uh, there that are... Well, I'll say a bit about that. Yeah. Unfortunately, not everyone was able to bring physical copies of their translation. But we have, um, we have one of Mara's translations, the one, the, actually the book that won the inaugural Spring Dress Prize. And I put a few of my translations out by publisher. One of my publishers is here, Chad Post of Open Letter Books and Dalsy Archive. And um, you will find, and so those are for anyone to take. So, but don't stampede. Just you can wait. <laughs> to, but if anyone's interested in taking a look at them, take a look and take them with you. You'll also note that in many of them, if you open up and you look inside, you will see the support from ATE. So thank you to Ainoa for that. Um, and uh, yes, those are the books that are free for the taking. Okay, we also had some uh, questions uh, in the um, well, Zoom from people joining us online, but we will take the questions at the end, I think. Okay, good. So, uh, Robin, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Robin. Uh, I'm a translator uh, from Astorian into English. Um, you'll see that I've got uh, a big kind of stack of books up here with me. Some of these are the things I'm going to be reading from, uh, but I also just wanted to bring them to show people here that Astorian literature does exist. Uh, there are books, there are lots of books, there are really good books, and hopefully, yeah, uh, I'll be reading some of them today. Um, so just a very quick introduction before I start reading um, for a bit of context for those of you who don't know. Um, so Asturias is the, the smallest region uh, represented here today on this panel, um, and it does have the smallest pool of potential writers and readers of any of the languages represented here. Um, it is also not one of the official languages of Spain currently, um, which is which are among the factors uh, influencing the fact that some of you may not have heard of Asturian, the Asturian language or indeed Asturian literature uh, before today. Uh, but hopefully you'll go home raving about it, fingers crossed. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start by reading a short story by an Asturian uh, author, poet uh, and translator called Laura Marcos, who is in fact here. Um, she, as well as being uh, a wonderful writer and poet, uh, has also translated uh, her own or with in the cooperation with some other uh, translators in Astorius. I'm not the only translator of Astorian into English, um, an anthology of Astorian, Astorian poetry uh, bilingually in Astorian and English, uh, which doesn't, which she has copies on. So, oh, so yeah, go and speak to her about that. Um, and hopefully uh, will at some point be published in English um, over here. Um, so without further ado, I'll start reading. I'm afraid I'm reading from this very small device. So if my eyes start bleeding during the <laughs> reading, that's why. Um, so this is a short story uh, called His Type by Laura Marcos. The afternoon had passed by in a happy haze of sunshine, laughter, and more than a few drops of cidra. But for the last while, David had been shuffling about in his seat, stealing glances at his watch. He was getting restless. As well as his frustration at having to go home so soon, he knew he'd be in for some grief. It was always the same when he made an early exit. The best he could do was to let it all wash over him, try and get through it as quickly as possible without it turning into an argument. Arguments weren't his thing, even if the others, Frecci especially, seemed to treat them as a sport. Without them noticing, David had been gently edging his chair back with his bum so he'd have enough room to stand up. He waited for the opportune moment, one of those slight pauses between conversation, then said, OK, time for me to head off. What? We've only been here five minutes, Fretchy shot back. Yeah, yeah, but I've got Paolo waiting at ours. 
why don't you call her and tell her to come and join us? We can go and get some food. It's ages since we've seen you, said Tamara, then she's Fretchy's girlfriend. I know, it's just, I can't today. Next weekend, maybe. I can't, I can't. Go on then. Why can't you, said Fretchy. Give her a call. If she wants to stay in, no problem, but at least you can stay here. Just for once, try being your own man. Thing, thing is, we're up at the crack of dawn tomorrow. David was standing now, and he was getting tired of having to explain himself. Crack of dawn on a Sunday, said Marthe, leaning across the table, eyebrow raised, doing his commissar bit, as they called it. But commissar or not, he was still going easier on David than Fetch he was. And at least with Marthe, he knew he was only messing. Yeah, I know, but we're going to her aunt and uncle's place tomorrow. The hay needs cutting. We said we'd go over and help. Right, but you can stay till 12 at least now. Come on, we'll go and get a bit of dinner and another drink or two. Then you'll be tucked up by midnight. You'll be up bright and early, no bother. Go on, give Paula a bell and come for a bite, said Tamara, a tone more conciliatory. Nah, seriously, I'm knackered anyway, to be honest. It's not to be. Next weekend, though. We can talk to him right now for next Saturday if you want. Next Saturday, my arse. Don't know why I bother. Fun sponges, the both of you. You know that. Fretchy could see he wasn't getting anywhere. And when Fretchy wasn't getting anywhere, Fretchy got personal. All right, all right. Well, have a good one, said David. Relieved the back and forth was drawing to a close. Freedom was finally in sight. I'll get that, I'll get that last round on my way out. See you next weekend. I hope you're ripped apart by wolves. You and that jailer you call a girlfriend, said Fretchy. By which time David was already making his way past the bar with a quick wave goodbye. Oh, come on, give him a break. You know what he's like. So what if he's a bit of a square? There's a David in every group. It's just the way it is, said Tamara, <laughs> giving Fretchy a gentle shove. My dad always said you can't trust this type. Clean shirts, said Fretchy. The <laughs> cigarette between his lips, bobbing to the rhythm of his words. He lit it as he finished speaking, putting the final touch to a cinematic pose. David left the bar and hurried home, the warm evening air brushing against his skin. He checked his watch again. The days were still long. Nearly half nine, it wasn't yet dark out. When he reached the entrance to their building, he was about to go in, but was briefly startled by the sound of the lock. Someone had opened, pressed the button to open it from the inside, and David, David stood back to let them out. It was a neighbour, an older man from his grandparents' generation. The man was accompanied by an ugly, snub-nosed little dog on a lead, which recoiled barking as soon as it saw David. Shush, Fifi, don't be silly, that's our neighbour. How are you, David? Back home already? Afraid so. David gave a shy, nervous smile. We're out in the hayfields tomorrow with Paola's lot, so we've got to get an early start. Ah, uh, haymaking, is it? Where's that round here? El, Qu El Quetta way. Paola and David had only moved in six months ago, but their neighbour took little more than a week or so to suss out exactly who their families were and placed them precisely within the time-space continuum of the town and its environs. Paola used to joke he was an undercover agent for the land registry office. No, it's over at her uncle's place towards Sistiago. That's why we're up so early. Early, right. But your kids, you've got the stamina. I bet you'd be up mowing those meadows no matter what shenanigans you got up to the night before. I did my fair share back in the day, I'll tell you that. And at fiesta time, don't get me started. Sure, yeah, of course, David interrupted. But, you know, every Saturday, it just gets a bit much. Anyway, I better go in for my tea, then it's off for bed. Absolutely to bed. Very sensible. David wasn't enjoying his neighbour's mischievous tone on the top of the hurry he was already in. All right, then. Good luck with that early start of yours and good night. David started making his way up to the first floor and before he'd even reached the top of the stairs, he heard Paola opening the door to their flat. I could hear you chatting to Savando. I was getting nervous. Yeah, Fretchy was kicking off as usual. Then bloody Savando turns up. Better get a move on. Uh, well, come in then. Tea's ready. Uh, I've done escalopinos, beef ones. I don't know if I've got time, love. I might be better off taking them in with me. Leave one of my hands free and I'll eat while we're getting ready, he said on his way into the kitchen. Paola arched her eyebrows. It'll be fine, look. I'll stick it in some bread and if I make a mess, I'll clean it up tomorrow. All right, if you say so. Paola waited as David potted about in the kitchen, then made his way to the bathroom. She followed. Everything was set up. The chains, the handcuffs, the gag and the bath. One of those adapted ones for disabled people. They bought it when they got the flat. When the parents asked, they said they'd been offered it on the cheap, a steal. They'd lined it with an old duvet to muffle the noise. David got in and fastened one of the handcuffs around his left wrist, threaded the other one through one of the grab rails and attached that to his left wrist as well. Then he and Paola wrapped the chain around his torso and through the other rails before Paola fastened it with a padlock. Leave the gag for a sec so I can finish my sandwich. 
<laughs> all right that way we can have a bit of a chat as well said paula kneeling down next to the back so they were at the same height so how are Fretchy and tamara doing fine they're asking after you as ever you want us to go and see them the weekend of the 18th oh yeah sounds good is the 18th all right should be two weeks today right practically a new moon i checked not even half what did you tell them this time uh, told them to get we had to get up early to help your uncle with the hay told Savando the same nice so speaking of tomorrow what do you fancy I thought maybe the beach but you'll be a bit of a wreck no I don't care let's do it I can have a sleep there but we better avoid the banis if we bump into the others they'll be fuming their eyes met and they shared a conspiratorial smile so how's your evening your evening shaping up nothing special thought I might watch a film then bed let's see if I actually managed to get any any sleep this time don't make life easy for you, do I? Depends. It's worse when it's on a weekday. I feel a lot more relaxed now with the neighbours, with the upstairs neighbours away. All right, love. I think it's time for you to make a move. They gave each other a quick kiss. You make me sick and I've never loved you, said David, screwing up his face <laughs> and not disgust. I know, I know. And you? Same. Don't get me wrong. The only reason I put up with this nonsense is I'm atoning for the sins of a past life. Night. She stuffed the gag in his mouth, tied a towel around his head then kissed him on the cheek and gave him a quick hug. His skin felt rough, different. Night, love, she said. Before she got up, she switched on a small lamp, turned off the main light, then stepped out of the bathroom and double locked it from the outside. As well as being a nice story, I thought a bit of dialogue wouldn't be a bad thing. In there. <laughs> um, so I'm going to move on to read uh, a couple of poems. Uh, I hope I'm not too, doing too badly for time. Uh, just start me when I run out. Uh, so I'm going to read a couple of poems. But first, I just wanted to read a little section from this book uh, called Notice de la Literatura Asturiana, uh, which is by another Asturian poet and literary critic called Marta Mori, um, who is a really important figure in the Astorian literary scene and a really excellent poet. Um, this is from something called the Abecedario Urgente de la Literatura Asturiana, so the, an urgent A to Z of Astorian literature. Um, and it was written uh, at first, about first published about five years ago, but this collect, published in this collection last year. Um, and she also mentions that the idea for the uh, A to Z came from uh, Bernardo Rochaga, the Basque writer. So a nice example of cross-pollination between less translated languages in Spain. Um, and this will hopefully give a bit of context to uh, Astorian writers uh, and Astorian writing. Uh, I, I haven't written down my translation of this, so I'm kind of doing it a little bit off the cuff. So, you know, be kind. <laughs> Anton Garcia. Uh, one of the most prestigious, one of our most prestigious writers says that Astorian literature is a miracle. These words express an opinion that the, the majority of Astorian authors tacitly share. That is to say, the Astorian literature exists in an in, inhospitable context. It lacks institutional support, especially with regards to the distribution and promotion of books. It barely has a presence in schools, in bookshops, in the media. There aren't very many readers with the linguistic competence required to enjoy the most complex works. It is practically invisible, bar a few exceptions, beyond the borders of Asturias itself. For that reason, the fact that, out, that, out, that authors such as Roberto González Quevedo, who released his first book in 1980, continue to publish works in Astorian with an unvanquishable loyalty, and that others, such as the young poet Raquel Menendez, who began writing in Spanish, are turning to the Astorian language uh, with, book, with as interesting results as you can find in this book, has something of the miraculous about it. Um, I think that's a pretty good summary of uh, the circumstances in which Astorian literature finds itself and the incredible work that Astorian writers do. Um, so now I'm going to read a few poems from this book by Raquel Menendez, who is uh, 
an Astorian language poet uh, and also academic, currently based at the University of Alcalá de Henares. Um, so the, the concept behind this book is that it was written at a time uh, when Raquel's grandmother was suffering from Alzheimer's and had stopped speaking. Um, and she's reflecting on what that means for Raquel's identity and her connection uh, to the place where she is from uh, and the culture and traditions that she's grown up with and that are so embodied by her grandmother. Um, and she does this through the figure of uh, Sherazad. Um, so the book is called El Libro Postumo de Sherazad. Um, and let's get the poems. Sorry, minor technical failure. Okay. One day you stop talking. That's where the poems are found, in the poem's absence. Before I contained all the days in the world, like a child's sweets wrapped in a handkerchief. By night, I would listen to the band Kalashiko in a house in the middle of nowhere. By day, I would get on my bike and ride it like a carriage. I would study, read all the books, books that spoke to me, not of myself, but of another I, that is, of another you. Books where you were a queen. Now I imagine myself a world where the two of us are in flight. And to Sherazade, I ask that my life no longer resemble a painting by Chagall. One day, you stop talking. I wanted to think the sound of your voice would linger here, but nobody reads you aloud anymore. Will the old half-blind Sherazade read you? Will your grandchildren? Will I read you? I, who have lost my name. Uh, okay, I'm gonna read a couple more poems, assuming that I'm all right for time. Um, this poem begins with a quote, um, from Maria Alvarez, uh, 84 years old at the time of writing, uh, from San Fricioso in Tineo in Asturias. Uh, and this is taken from the Atlas Sonoro de la Lingua Asturiana. Um, I'll read the, the quote in Asturian first because it's very hard to translate. I spent a long time struggling with this uh, and I'm not wholly happy with it. But anyway, the, the original uh, quote is just great. Anyway. Entonces tengo que callar porque luz ahora no lo sé y aludantes no val. Then I'll just say nothing because the present makes no sense and the past is no longer of use. I started talking when the birds left the home where Sherazard sits in silence. Her beak is buried in my chest, the nameless absence of all the things that seemed futile. In a house where Sherazard is silent, women's memories are stolen. Old women who, like her, know where we are bound, what we are searching for, where we'll end up next. And the grandchildren babble like the dead because the absent are no, lo the absent are no longer listened to. They have nothing to say. And you'll be left so alone that the world will lose its shine and I my spark. It wasn't written, but you'll fall silent like the leaves fall slowly. You'll lose your name of 20 years. You'll have everything you now lack. Who will write your posthumous book? If nobody can hear you, only me, a 20 year old stranger born in 93. Uh, and to finish, I'll just read one more. So that I could be here, someone had to hold nothing but a broom, a coffee pot, a straw basket. So that I could have clean and empty hands, someone had to know no more than the passing of clouds, the shade of the patio. So that I could know them, I had to know nothing, always in proximity. Proximity to mother, proximity to man. So that I could be here, Sherazade had to die many deaths, swallow her tongue, my roar, all those people inventing a world. Not sure how much time I've got left, or if that's, that's a couple of minutes. Okay, that's fine. Um, Two minutes, okay, yeah, um, that's fine. So I just wanted to say that um, if you wanna hear more 
a story in writing. Uh, I also recorded, as Tina already mentioned, uh, recorded a reading for Translators Aloud, which is not something that I've read here today. Um, it's an extract from an uh, unpublished, well, unpublished in English novel uh, by the Astorian writer Francisco Alvarez, uh, who's also a translator uh, into Astorian uh, and into Spanish from Italian. Um, so uh, something that I think people working with many other lesser translated languages will probably uh, have similar experiences of is that many Astorian writers are themselves translators uh, and often translate into and out of Astorian. And I think that's one of the nice things about working with a language like Astorian that you're so often working with other trans writers, but writers who are also other translators. And so there's a, a nice kind of uh, mutual understanding and solidarity there. Um, so uh, the book that I read from uh, on Translators Aloud is called Lluvia de Agosto. Uh, it was published by Ocha de Lata, uh, a publisher based in Shishon, who published in both Spanish and Astorian. Um, and it's about uh, it's about the figure of uh, Duruti. Some of you may know the anarchist Duruti, uh, who dies during the Spanish Civil War. Um, and it's another great book. So I would encourage you to go and listen to that. Um, and yeah, don't forget about the existence of Astorian literature. Talk to Laura about her anthology. Um, read the Riveter. Um, and also, as I said yesterday. Every time you read the word Austrian, make sure that you are reading the word Austrian and not the word Asturian. <laughs> because I really worry about the long term. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. Or Australian, perhaps, Robin. Hard act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read you uh, an extract translation by. Uh, from a novel called Twist, which was written by Arkait Scano and published by Sosa in 2011. And I'm going to read, first of all, a few lines, just a very few in Basque, because there may be some of you here who've never heard the language. Then I'm going to read uh, a little bit more in English, and then I will tell you, I'll talk a little bit about why translating between Basque and English is different from translating between English and any of the other languages here, which are all Indo-European, which Basque is not. And uh, finally, I'll tell you the, well, uh, no, second to last, I'll tell you the sad, sad story of why my translation isn't the one which is published out there. And uh, so this is going to be a bit of um, an ephemeral uh, exclusive content. You may, may never appear anywhere ever again. <laughs> and finally, I'll mention, as Olga mentioned, I work at a place called Booktegi, which is an online platform, which has some similarities with Riveter, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, I should also mention that I'm slightly dyslexic, so please don't be very angry if uh, I stumble across my words from time to time. Anyway, here we go. Just a few lines, as I say, in the original language. Gawa da kampoan, gawa esatea merezidu. Lurraren erraetan beti da gaua, satorren ordua da satorraren domenioetan. Asola dio ezer egun argik lurpirean biziden ari? Ezke jeki. Bat egin da zaude espalde honetan lurrarekin, bat ere ez mugitzea zenukela onena iruditan zaizu azieran. Zure erraiak eta lurrarenak errai berak ez dira ba, haotz zeljuriko batek diotxu, abandonatu zure aizurrak betiko, ze arraio. So have you all understood that? <laughs> Do you understand me at least? Yeah, uh, my wife doesn't, so that's good. So let's see. Uh, so why is it different translating uh, with Basque? Well, because it's not an Indo-European language, but that would just be a classification, wouldn't it? Um, it's Basque uh, doesn't have the number of readers or writers, but that's, that's an anecdote in these terms, really. Uh, some people say it's a very old language. Well, maybe, but so I, uh, lots of other languages. The main thing I think is that Basque is a Bluetooth language, by which I mean that almost all the components of a sentence you have to configure, you have to set up before you can put them into the sentence, otherwise it doesn't work. So uh, once you've done that, once you've set up all the words, once you've configured them, put them through their, their paces, then you have within certain very practical constraints, you have a lot of freedom to express nuances in a very precise way and in a very natural way. 
So the constraints are mostly that you mention the subject of the sentence normally at the beginning. Then before the verb, you mention what's called the galdegaya, which means the matter under examination or being questioned. And then normally the verb at the end of the sentence. So I'll give you a sort of tracing paper example of this. The Cervantes panel, the Cervantes panel discussion, today we will have. So that would be the normal order to do it in Basque. Now, this leads me to why it's different translating Basque than translating all your uh, fantastic Indo-European languages, which are so close to English. I mean, if you take a sentence like, I have suffered, how would you say that in Spanish? Yo he sufrido. You'd have to have a very, very cloth uh, mind not to get that one, I think. Uh, in Basque, I say it's different. So the first job for the translator is to change all the syntax and most of the vocabulary. So there's a lot of initial work. However, I would say that uh, in the same way that in Spanish, I think you say, uh, al soldado se le supone la valentía, or something like that, don't you? To uh, a translator is supposed to know languages. So that's not really the great trick. For me, the big thing about translating is finding the voice or the voices within a translation and then stay loyal to them. And Robin, hats off, I love that short story. I thought that was a fantastic example of how to find a voice and carry the voice through the translation. So now I'll read you a little bit of the uh, English translation. Uh, as I say, this is um, exclusive content and uh, no one, it's possible that no one will ever hear this again. So remember this moment. It's night outside, it deserves to be night. It's always night in the earth's roots. It's the mole's time in the mole's domain. Does somebody who lives under the earth care about the light of day? Not too much. You've been one with the earth for some time now, and right at the start, you decided that the best thing was not to move around. Aren't your roots and those of the earth the same? A terrestrial voice says to you, give up your bones forever. What does it matter? Aren't bones drumsticks for the drummer, a flute for the flautist? Are you so attached to that pair of humerus and those shin bones, which you can hardly even use to beat a drum anymore? Where will you be better than lying down? Thousands of worried people who can't get to sleep will agree with, it, with this. The time you're asleep is the best time. But spending so many years without moving can't be good. You'd like to shake your extremities out of their pins and needles, wake the tips from your fingers up a little. If I could take my finger bones out of their joints, flex them and then chain them up again. You have the feeling you have the dentist's plaster inside your jaws. You find it hard to open your eyes too and say to yourself, the guy who embalmed me wasn't very good at it. <laughs> a part of your brain is taken over by a type of white dust which is drier than soil, memory lost, magnesium, quick lime. This, uh, this novel twist is most of the story is told in a fairly naturalistic way. It's based around a historical event, which I won't bore you with now. It's full of uh, secondary characters who are well rounded out. So um, there are not flat characters as described by Ian Forster. They're all interesting characters. It's a, it's a, I really recommend this book. And I can do that, uh, so to speak, impartially because the translation available is not mine. The translation was uh, done by uh, Amaya Gavancho, who I believe is one, one of your old pupils, is that right? You, I think, did you mention that you know, know her? Oh, I know her. Yeah, right, you know her. Okay, so um, yesterday at the meeting, um, at uh, the, well, the conference at the book fair, the poet Beatrice Civite asked an interesting question, which was, she asked, um, uh, Susie Wilde from Parthian, who's over there, if she was happy about giving translation uh, works to jobs to people who are not translating into their mother tongue. And for example, Amaya's mother tongue is not English. She's from a beautiful place called Bermeo on the coast of Vizcaya. And um, I should say before I give my take on this, that I have vested interests in, in the question. One is that I myself translate into Basque on occasion, and my translations are published in Basque. And the other is that I teach reverse translation at the University of Deusto in Bilbao. Uh, so that means I teach people to translate from Basque into Spanish and into English. My argument is that, uh, and you know, there are many different ways to approach it. My argument is that at least that way, the translator knows and understands all the nuances in the original text. Then 
for any translator, I, I think you'll agree, you need somebody to read it through for you and to check it and, and proofread it. So in this case, maybe the proofreader is going to have a, a larger load of work than the other more conventional way, which is translating into your own language. However, I think there's an argument to be made for it. And I, I think, you know, um, uh, Gora Amaya, I think it's great that she's um, working all the time. Great stuff. And uh, did I have something else to mention? Uh, yeah, Bookpeggy, which is... Uh, it's a digital platform that we set up in 2017, and uh, we saw two two things missing in the Basque uh, cultural uh, world. Uh, sometimes a world is smaller than a country, and they were that electronic books weren't being used very much, and because of financial constraints, lots of uh, books which really deserved a second edition and a second uh, run around the block weren't being given that chance, and lots of other good books were not being published. So we thought, ah, right. Ebooks are really cheap to produce. So what we do is pretty well every week we bring out a book, which is either an old book or a new book. We give them, we try to give them attractive covers. We try to give them forwards by distinguished writers, and um, and that's it. And it's also developed into doing lots of uh, live shows and videos and and uh, audio books. And uh, so that's it. I've just remembered. I haven't told you the sad, sad story of why I didn't get to translate <laughs> Twist. Um, as Robin mentioned, and I'm sure everyone will um, have the same experience now, if you if you work in a sm fairly small language community in, in the arts world, you end up meeting everyone. So the writer, the writer of Twist is a, is a friend of mine, you know, we'll go out for an ale once in a while. And uh, I translated this first passage of the book, which is a sort of stream of conscious thing in contrast with the rest of the book. And I said, uh, Arkeis, what about a beer? Yep beer and then I slapped it down on the table printed I seem to remember I didn't give him my mobile phone and uh, so he read it through as we were sitting in in that that corner bar and uh, he liked it and uh, yeah gave me the go ahead the people at uh, the good people at uh, Reno University in the States had also given me had previously said if you can get the author's permission we'll print it and uh, so great I walked back home with a spring in my step very happy and thinking about what a wonderful experience it was going to be translating the whole book over the following I don't know, six months, something like that, at least. And uh, before I started on uh, the, the main body of the book, uh, Arkaitz, the author, phoned me and said, <clears throat> you know, when I said to you, you could translate the book, I've just remembered that, that I gave Amaya Gavancho permission earlier and signed the contract. So <laughs> what can you do? Things, things happen. Anyway, that, that's all for me for the moment, I think. So whoever's next, uh, it's your turn. Of course, I have to follow Basque, the coolest language in Spain. <laughs> my name is Mara, and I'm here to talk a little bit about Catalan literature, my experiences being a translator of Catalan literature. Um, and because recently I've been reading uh, Josep Palau y Fabra, I'm uh, going, who rails against no sentisma and sen common sense in uh, favor of madness. I'm going to um, go for the alchemy, as he would say. His, his nickname is the alchemist. So the first thing I'd like to say is I think there's an amazing alchemy in this room today. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while and uh, there's a lot of partners here who've supported my work over the years from the Spanish government, the Catalan government, uh, open letter, it, everyone. Um, and to be here, I think this is a historic moment um, to get everybody together in this room and talk about uh, how many languages there are in Spain, some of which are not even official or co-official. So um, I'm often asked how I became a translator of Catalan and I wonder about it myself. And I've recently been trying to expand my idea of what it means to write in Catalan or to be a Catalan writer, um, instead of having a facile idea about what political stance you have because you write in Catalan, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and how this has evolved uh, throughout the 20th century particularly, and brought us to the 21st century where, as we know, every two weeks, a language dies out. 
I happen to be from Brooklyn, a town you might have heard of, um, it, where I don't even call my language American or Brooklynese or um, I call it English. Um, and that intersection between Katzon identity and Katzon language was something that I always found very intriguing on an emotional level. Um, and so that was part of it. Um, maybe more than 30 years ago now, I had the chance to study in Madrid as part of my undergraduate degree. Um, in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, there was a lot of uh, Caribbean Spanish. And so I understood that that was something interesting to study. Couldn't understand why anyone would study French. That were the only uh, other option I had. Uh, I went to public school in the American sense, not the British sense. Um, and it, when I was in Spain, this is a silly story, but um, I'll repeat it because it's it stayed with me. Someone said to me, oh, be careful when you go to Barcelona, because if you fall in the street and you need a Band-Aid plaster uh, and you don't know how to ask for it in Catalan, no one's going to help you. Um, this was obviously not a very um, sophisticated person who said this to me. Um, and little did they know I would spend uh, more than two years trying to speak in Catalan to people and having them switch to Spanish because my Catalan was so bad. Um, and they assumed that my Spanish was better, which it was, but um, isn't necessarily the case. But it's actually um, one of the uh, political linguistic campaigns that we have in Catalonia is actually stickers on the, on the uh, windows of storefronts where they say, it's okay, you can come in and practice your bad Catalan here. <laughs> we won't switch to Spanish. Um, so uh, this idea of political linguistics, which is a little bit the elephant in the room today, um, is something that's uh, always intrigued me since I found out about it. Um, and uh, there is a quote from a former minister of political linguistics, which is a job in Catalonia. Um, which uh, was surprising to me when I first learned about it, where he said, see, I wrote it down so I would say it right. Uh, of course, this is my translation. Every state develops linguistic politics, even when they aren't explicitly stated. And I realized um, that in my own American context, um, there were a lot of linguistic politics that were not explicitly stated. I was not uh, I didn't grow up speaking indigenous language. I also didn't, I don't speak any of the languages of my grandparents. And I saw that anyone who was more than second generation was only speaking English, not even English, American or Brooklynese or, uh, you know. Uh, so this is always something that I've found fascinating. Um, and within Catalonia, and I wrote about this a little bit, in the small article that I did for the Riveter about why I think Catalan language has a decent presence in the uh, Anglophone literature sphere. Um, so you can read about it more there, but um, obviously the languages that are most rapidly dying out are languages that are only spoken languages. And in Catalonia, we have a very long publishing history, um, also in Spanish, uh, but in, and, uh, well, I have a quote from Palawi Fabra that uh, is intriguing me lately, uh, which is, again, my translation, a Catalan writers suffer from a serious inferiority complex because our greatest writer was our first writer, Ramon Yul, you may have heard of him. <laughs> Unlike Shakespeare, Goethe, or Cervantes, who had a few centuries of preparation, our Ramon Yul in the 13th century was so splendorous and so prolific and to top it all off, wrote in three languages, Catalan, Latin, and Arabic. So in Catalonia, when I moved there, um, I became aware of this undercurrent of another language and sort of layers. And since then I have ended up kind of devoting my life to peeling off those layers um, and they're they're quite complex. Um, 
However, there is something about a uh, Catalan literature that has to do partly with our long publishing history um, that is what I call like an invocation to linguistic heroism. There's this idea that uh, we need to, we, uh, that Catalan writers need to ensure that uh, Catalan language doesn't die. And um, obviously different uh, regimes within the Spanish state have not been very helpful in this goal. Um, and, but we are now in a moment uh, where we're having this discussion, which this is the first time I've been in a room like this, as I say, with this alchemy. Um, and I recently received a prize uh, that is open to only, sorry, the official languages of Spain, but um, and I that's uh, given by the Spain USA Foundation. So I think that this is also a, important historically. There's another prize that's called the Queen Sophia, I think, um, that is only for Spanish languages, but it's actually open to all of Latin American uh, literature, which is interesting. So this is um, the first winner of this first prize that uh, maybe should be open to all languages of Spain, just putting that out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it is a little bit equal opportunity offensive and about translation. So I thought I would read from that today. We can also have the editor here. Um, so here we go. Having bid farewell to the governor, our hero on his way back to the hostel ran into the native translator who had defended him in court, sitting on a corner beneath a weak streetlight, drinking a bottle of fire water all by his lonesome. He'd taken off his white shirt and linen pantaloons and was dressed in the garb of the Guayaquiri tribe amulets hanging around his neck. Gregorio approached him and asked, thou art the translator Luis Pajares, right? I have to thank thee for defending me at the trial. Darn tootin', you owe me more than thanks, my lord. I need a job after court today or I'll end up eating wood since I'm flat broke and only want to tie on a big trial tribulation with this here hot fire water, he said. But my name is Arapuro, not Luis Pajares. Luis is the name some over-the-top Christian Dima with this horribus bad taste gave me. I'm not going to read the footnotes. <laughs> Buy the book. <laughs> I prefer my birth name if it's not too mucho to ask. And as for my name changes, bam, methinks thou hath a little problem of thine own. What cheek, our hero exclaimed in surprise. Since when doth an Indian speak that way to an officer of the king? Come now, I never did meet no Injun. I only know Tasermes, Tomuces, Pirutus, Guaguires, Guaykiris, Chacopates, Cochaimas, Palenques, Caracares, and a bunch more you've been playing Macumba Tarumba from long since before you guys showed up, said Irapuro. The word Indian is something you long-legged, hairy moochers use to insult us. <laughs> Guaykiri or not Guaykiri, that is the question. Thou crossest Thou crossest the line, Luis, or Idapuro, or whatever. But I shall grant you pardon, Marg, the fact that thou art a malapert prince of insolence. However, do not forget that as a mestizo, thine life is worth zilch. Mm -hmm. Not this again, bro. I thought you were a good guy against slavery and all. Or at least that's what I thought I heard during the trial. Although you neglected to mention that Bartolome de las Casas, in his 12 doubts treaties, demanded abandoning the Indies and returning all the goods you dosarao have been fleecing extra legally for two centuries. Granted, that self-same huevon apparently said that instead of Indians, you should enslave Blacks, which isn't a great look for a clergyman. You're all a pack of bewhiskered cretinos. Goodness sakes, don't push thine luck and be more polite, ordered Gregorio Izquierdo. If I had said all that at the trial, I'd right well be executed now for insurrection. You'll get your come up and sooner or later, bro, uh -huh. said Aida Puro. For those very same laws of the Indies make any and all injustice impossible by authorizing our enslavement and suffering. So just so ye bearded dudes can throw your little Catholic shindigs. I dost favor a Getty as much as the next dude, but you're raping and pillaging blotted out the sun. But here inland, even the most saintly has a scantling of the devil in him. I must admit, 
thou art not wrong. By the way, how be it that thou knowest so much of laws and letters? asked our hero. Because I'm a southerner, born in the old world, son of a guayquerí and a Spanish prostitute, the opposite of Inca Garcilaso, who was the son of a Peruvian noblewoman and aristocratic Spanish conquistador, replied Irapuro, taking a long gulp of fire water before continuing. Of course, my dear parents gave me up when I was a baby for mestizo, left me in a Dominican, the Dogs of God monastery, and I was raised there by servants and educated by a friggin' friar with a perfect bald pate up to the task of any grammarian and extremely fond of nice looking brown lads. But there were other lads like me in that monastery. And one day they rose up and burnt it down, roasting all the friars. From there, I was condemned to the galleys at the age of 13, where I rode my way over to the new world, which I consider mine true homeland. I landed in the Cumana, having fulfilled my sentence and I enlisted in the Spanish army, but everyone dis give me the side eye for being a half-breed. So I sought out the Guayqueris, but my father's tribe didn't accept me either, taking me for a foreign mutt from Carupa. Blech. Between one side and the other, I began to fear for my life. So I put down my sword and picked up the books, studying grammar, Latin, Spanish, and some of the languages of my native region. Once I was able to namina languages on my own, I put down the books and started working as a translator for the Spanish. This is getting awfully long. <laughs> I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, uh, Be thou the one in charge now and I'm the vassal, asked our hero. Giving orders to the one in charge, serving the servant, that be the true obligation between free men, said Araipuro. Quit it with the paradoxes, Araipuro. I'm starting to regret putting thee in mine service. Bro, if it makes you happy, you can call me Indian or Epsilon, and I shall call thee Master Alpha. And that way your conquering soul will be more assuaged and pious. But don't be a skin flint and pay me well, translators. <laughs> if thou wouldest be so kind and just because, okay, okay, sound like a deal? Talk less and thou shalt live longer, Indian. And now put down that bottle. You're beyond stewed and the devil bathes in that stuff. Let's hit the road already. Thank you. I got my whole 20. Oh boy. Maybe I was looking for a way out. Um, I guess, first of all, I just, this is so nice that this many people are here at this event. Um, so thank you all for coming. Also, it's very much a joy to listen to all of your work. When I first was sitting over there, my heart was racing a little bit more, but then just sitting down and listening to everyone read, I was like, Suddenly, I'm much calmer. Um, so, <laughs> this guy asked me. Anyway, oh, I haven't even. My name is, so I'm Jacob Rogers. I translate from Galician. Um, there's so much that you've also all said that I would love to respond to, but I am supposed to talk about Galicia. <laughs> I will just say um, I've been going around lately making the wild and very unverifiable claim that Galician writers are the funniest in Spain. Um, but, Robin, I'm a bit upset because I think you're, I suddenly feel a bit <laughs> like maybe I shouldn't be saying that. Um, anyway, so I don't know. I guess I'll, I'll start by reading to give myself more of a framework before I go blabbering. Um, but so today I'm here to read um, from a book by Jesus Fraga, who's actually also been invited to join us today. Um, this book won the National Literature Prize in Spain for prose in 2020, I want to say. 2021. Thank you for the. Um, and although it is a memoir and never pretends to be anything but, people often refer to it as a novel because it is so well and beautifully written that it, and the character predominantly of his grandmother feels so larger than life that I think it's just impossible. People find it impossible that this could just be a memoir and not something that he's invented out of nothing. Um, on which note, the cover is actually a picture of his grandmother, his mother, uh, his aunt, and I guess he's just told me his other aunts won't speak to him anymore. You can choose that one five. Um, <laughs> um, 
I know. We can always blame the designer. Um, also, I guess I can speak a little bit more about this later, but uh, in March, I had the privilege of being in Galicia for a month on a residency, which I will again get into later. But I'm not still convinced that Jesus didn't orchestrate this, but he was taking me around his uh, hometown of Betanzos, well, not his hometown, I guess, because he was born in London, but his current town of Betanzos. And lo and behold, we run into his very mother and his aunt and another character from this novel, almost as if they just magically appeared. <laughs> which was a really special moment actually having already translated a sample. Um, so I will get into reading it and I wanna actually follow along and just read the first sentence in Galician just so you can get a sense of what the language sounds like if you don't already know. Cuando a boa se anoxaba, acendíaselle un brillo de cereza nos hoyos e apertaba os dentes nun aceno severo que lle tiraba do queixo para arriba e lle tensabas en gurras. Now I'll read in English. So this will be from the very beginning. Otherwise, I, I would give you introduction, but this is how you'd be if you're reading the book, so you can deal without it. <laughs> Chapter one, grandmother and grandson. Anytime my grandmother got angry, her eyes would flash with a feral gleam and she would clench her teeth in a grim rictus, lips pursed, jaw quaking. She reminded me in these moments of a bulldog sniffing your slightest weakness, your slightest misstep. She would crouch into a squat and eye you from this low vantage, which rather than undermine her authority, was a clear sign she was primed to attack. When my grandmother got angry with me, it was almost always because I either questioned her infallible opinions or because some problem had arisen which, according to her, was my fault, but which, from my perspective, was purely a misunderstanding. She didn't care what I had to say, batting away my defenses with an unmatchable argument. Estás wrong. <laughs> also, I think it's notable that the grandmother's bilingualism in this book is not a Spanish Galician bilingualism, it's an English Galician bilingualism. Um, the angriest she's ever been with me, the nearest I've ever felt the bulldog's fangs to my face, was one morning outside her flat in London. We were on our way to the airport to catch a flight to Galicia and had lugged our suitcases down to the vestibule. I'm going to see if I can find a taxi at High Street Kensington. You stay here with our things, she had ordained, before opening the door and descending the steps down to the pavement, still deserted and lit by the feeble yellow of the street lamps in the early hours of the morning. Watching her walk in the direction of the faint murmur of traffic from the main road, I felt a sudden, irrepressible urge to follow her. To this day, I still don't know why I acted on it. Maybe it was an impulsive, childish fear of being left alone. Whatever the case, I rushed down the five steps separating the pavement from her front door, which I'd made sure to shut, I suppose out of some instinct and not to leave our belongings unattended. Wait, I'm coming with you. My grandmother had already set off walking and didn't hear me. I nearly had to run to catch up. She couldn't have been more incredulous when she saw me. What are you doing here? What if someone shuts the door? Didn't you see I left my keys with my purse? I confessed that the door had already been shut, though I neglected to mention that I was the culprit. Predictably, her incredulity turned to rage, followed by a litany of vehement curses, which I immediately set to work repressing. Any attempt to reproduce them here would be an exercise in memory, and exercises in memory are always more of a reinvention than a retelling. But anyway, I'd never be able to do the experience justice. Things weren't looking good for us, stuck outside my grandmother's building at four in the morning with no key and all our bags inside. The only bright spot was that thanks to my grandmother's perennial insistence on arriving three or four hours before takeoff, we still had loads of time. As was her custom, as soon as my grandmother had finished discharging her anger, she solved the problem. She rang the bell for the housekeeper, as she called the housekeeper who lived in the street level flat. After a few minutes, his black face grumpily peered out from behind, behind the curtains. He was even grumpier when he came out and opened the front door, returning us to the security of the vestibule and the relieving sight of our luggage. I let out a silent sigh of relief while my grandmother placated him with a self-interested, albeit accurate, version of events. My grandson, he go outside with no keys and close the door. He is stupid, crazy, stupid. Have I mentioned yet that this is an exercise in memory? These castigations were but one of the many and varied manifestations of my grandmother's famous temper. If you showed any signs of lollygagging or simply couldn't keep up, she would unleash the full force of her wrath upon you, no exceptions. 
chop, chop, Maria Isabel, she, sh she once shouted at my mother, who had fallen behind with the heavy shopping bags. And this teasing command even made its way into our family lexicon. We found it funny to see these rare displays of maternalism in my grandmother, hidden by her living abroad and by the inflexible, impatient shell the self-sacrificial tend to armor themselves in. And it was undeniably tickling to see my mother briefly turned into the docile child she hadn't been for a long time, ever since circumstances had forced her to become a mother, not just to herself, but also to her two young sisters. Of course, that was long before I was born. Another part of the humor for us was in how odd her expression sounded to our young ears. Having grown up in a predominantly Spanish speaking milieu, we couldn't help but be simultaneously fascinated and amused by her old, founding, old fashioned sounding Galician. These nuts are valorecidas, she said, she once said, for example. My cousins and I, who had never once heard the word valorecidas used to indicate moldiness, burst into peals of laughter. And then there was her repertoire of composite words. Between her vehemence and our never having heard these words before, we always assumed she'd simply made them up. You've got to esmachucalo, she would say, doubling the impact that the Galician esmagar, or the Spanish machucar, to crush in both cases, would have had on their own. Not to mention the ferocious refrains that Lietleta left us equally tittering and terrified. Oh, this one's so intense. God knows what came over that woman, walking around like a whore at Lent. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, not my words, hers. Uh, 25, years in, 25 years in London, which she was already well into by the time we were kids, hadn't stopped a certain understratum of her formerly rural life from cropping up occasionally in her speech. And she still used old phrases from back then. It's like Korea out here, she would say as a catch-all for a negative sort of surprise, which reinforced her natural expressiveness. Her phonetic adaptations of place names in the British capital, Edgewa, Edgware Road, or Jaime Smith, Hammersmith, also colored her British Galician, but nothing was as liable to send us into an uncontrollable fit of laughter as her awe-inspiring, high-powered collision of curse words. Fucking merda. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I've done justice to her pronunciation, but... But this didn't mean my grandmother couldn't be infected by our laughter, which she would cut short with another famous phrase. Quiet, quiet, I'm going to pee myself. On which note, I want to finish reading from this with a slight little excerpt from a later chapter, which you'll see the relevance of maybe by the end. <laughs> My grandmother walked the London streets as comfortably as she had the winding back roads between Chandrozo and Betanzos, from Montellos and Piadela. She'd even imported some habits from her rural foot travels. One such habit left me utterly dumbstruck the first time I was confronted with it. It was a calm Saturday afternoon, and we were walking down one of the garden lanes in Kensington on our way to the flat of a Galician woman my grandmother would see whenever she needed a haircut. It was a sort of idyll typical of London. Perfect weather, muffled, distant sounds of traffic, no other humans in sight, surrounded by elegant red brick houses and the vibrant green of the bushes and trees lining the sidewalks. Until, that is, my grandmother stopped cold, falling a few paces behind me. She looked as if she'd caught a scent in the air and had begun scouting the area with her calculating eyes. I'm going to stop for a pee between those two cars. Is that a problem? <laughs> Why would you stop to pee right now? Why not? I do it all the time. <laughs> My initial shock gave way to alarm at the prospect of someone walking by at that very same moment, and a shiver of anticipated humiliation lanced up my back. Aren't we already close to Maria's house? It's just around the corner. Wouldn't you rather wait a couple minutes and do it in her bathroom? I could wait if I wanted to, but why? <laughs> Without giving me a chance to respond, my grandmother turned momentarily back into Virtudes and squatted down to pee between two cars, like she'd said she would, and as I was sure she'd done so many times in the maize fields back home. The episode was over in a matter of seconds, as promised. She sprung up and set off walking. Could have sworn she walked faster than before. This was only the first time, the first of many times I was left as a bystander to the same scene whether behind the cover of a bush in front of a house or beside a tree. I was astonished by this instinctual knowledge, her ability to find the perfect spot away from prying eyes, and by the nonchalance of her squat, a stunning feat of slyness that never ceased to leave me in a state of profound awe and embarrassment, no matter how many times I witnessed it. Didn't you use the bathroom before we left? I did, but with all that tea. <laughs> I'm so sorry to the, all the British people in the South. Um, so oh, where to even begin? Um, 
I guess just to talk a little bit about Galicia and the literary world and the system, uh, I don't want to be, people who know me know that I complain a lot and I don't want to complain here. So I also won't talk about the sort of, uh, you know, the how many books are published, uh, how many people speak, how many people, you know, what have you, because I'm really not qualified. Um, but I think what is noteworthy is that Galicia, basic, I think someone else mentioned this, I think it might have been Ainoa, Spain does everything. Every kind of book you can imagine is produced in Spain. And the same kind of thing is true in Galicia. We have brilliant memoirs. Some of the most successful authors in Galicia and then as well in Spain are writers of children's literature. Some of the even more successful writers in Spain are poets. And of course, they also have a rich tradition of prose, but really the breadth of literature could not be more vast. Um, and I think one of the ways that I particularly resonate with that um, as I work as a bookseller in the United States, and one of the things that I think always I find most interesting about Galicia is that they have a very vibrant um, community of small presses, not just maybe it could be one or two people, it could be three or four, but they are publishing some of the most interesting work in Galician right now, as well as making books more beautiful, I think, often than the books we make in the US and England with our sort of mania on cover design. Somehow they, they do it even better. Um, but how am I doing? Oh, wow. Um, but I also do want to acknowledge um, something I forgot to mention in a podcast we were recording earlier, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it now. Uh, it, so in March, I was in Galicia. I was lucky enough to be on a residency that only is a few years old now. Um, that was not started by the government per se. It was actually started by uh, a Galician poet named Yolanda Castaño, who is a sort of marvel of professionalism and great poetry. And she has been going to international fairs and residencies for years and really doing a lot by herself just to increase the profile of Galician literature. And by doing that, she also saw how important it was to have residencies and that sort of thing. Not, not just, you know, obviously it's important that we have samples and funding for book translations, but also time, space, and a very beautiful apartment in the heart of Acoruña, which is also a very beautiful city. Um, and what that did for me was also was uh, allowed me to translate, uh, maybe not perfectly, but a couple pol polished-ish revisions of two novels, uh, one of which uh, is by Bryce Lamela, who's a debut novelist. But I think the story of his novel also illustrates the point I'm making about the small presses in Galicia. It was published um, last year by a publisher called Euseno, which I don't believe, I think refuses to even use a major distributor. Um, they sort of keep themselves out of the sort of mainstream um, environment, but it was one of the best selling books in Galicia that year, was mentioned in El País, which is like the Spanish, you know, if you get mentioned in El País even as a Spanish writer, I think you've done something right. Um, and it's that sort of like, I don't know if I would have ever been able to even translate that book if it weren't for having this residency because I needed not because I couldn't have, but because I needed just sort of a time and space to just do the whole thing. It's a very difficult book to excerpt, so it didn't feel like I would ever be able to do it justice um, with uh, just having a sample. Um, I guess in that sense too, I think it's important to recognize that Galicians also translate books into Galician. Uh, this isn't really relevant to me in any particular way, but I think something that we often forget about, or, that, or at least that I've been thinking about more, is the importance, um, not just for me as a translator to have connections with the English-speaking publishing world, but also for Galician writers to have connections with people in other, whether they be in Spain, Latin America, or just writers in other languages. And I think to see the sort of interesting work that Galicians are translating, for example, one of these small presses that I love, uh, just published a translation of a book by Anne Carson, uh, by Jesus Castro Yanez. Uh, and I don't know if there's really an edition like it in Spanish either. So there's a, there's a sense too that the Galicians are publishing books that aren't necessarily be published, being published in Spain all the time. Um, and Yolanda is also a big part of that. She has a cycle where she's always inviting poets from abroad, whether they be Mexico, whether they be the United States, whether they be Latvia or anywhere, and bringing them to Galicia the same way she brought me to Galicia and sort of creating these small links that seem sort of too small to have any real impact at the time. But I think over time, it builds a network and connects them to people and sort of decreases their reliance on Spanish as a bridge language. Because a lot of people, I think, 
we think, oh, they've been translated into Spanish. Finally, like this means that they can reach the rest of the world. But I think we need to be, or at least I and everyone, we need to be thinking more about how we legitimize, like is a book legitimate because it's been translated now into Spanish or can we find ways to sort of worry less about that um, and focus on what's being published in Galicia and how beautiful it is. Um, I guess I will end with an anecdote and then one last reading, if you'll allow me. Um, in regards to the to this, <laughs> is that my? <laughs> um, I think just this this sort of idea of connection and and writers can sort of writing about or talking to other places and people. Uh, the first time I was ever in Galicia, when I was still in my early twenties and was just learning Galicia, and I happened to go into a bookstore and I flipped through this literary magazine. Um, and I just happened to find this poem by this young poet who was almost the same age as me, al -Bati. And I'm very surprised to find that this poet in Galicia, this region I've just discovered, has written a poem about North Carolina, which is the state that I'm from. And I think that in and of itself, at a time when I still wasn't quite sure that Galicia, like, you know, I was still figuring my, my life path out. It's that sort of small emotional connection that you have that really brings you, I think, into more of a, um, community with the language that you're translating from. So I wanted to just read that poem, which I translated a few years ago, um, and is another good example. I translated that poem for uh, Words Without Borders, which is another, I think like the European Lit Network is just some a project that's doing a ton for bringing translators more recognition. And since then we've done a feature with Galician, of Galician literature with Words Without Borders. So just this one little thing, North Carolina, Galicia, just it expands into a, a much bigger thing. Also, before I forget, it does thematically tie into the theme of migration. So don't worry, this is not something that I just thought of this morning. Uh, it's called An Apocryphal History of the Discovery of Migration or the Sacrifice of the Peilstorken. I, wearing, wearing heron symmetrically opposed over my chest, swore to the five emperors that there was no such thing as balance, that if herons upheld the rivers on all Chinese porcelain, it was simply due to a locking mechanism in their joints. They awarded me for risking everything in my defense. I wrote to you a few years later. I said, Rasta, 6th of the July. It's awful of me to interrupt, but I just need you to understand how certain kinds of wounds can be useful. I'm finishing up an essay on pre-modern explanations for bird migration and all the species seen since Aristotle's time as either moon travelers or sailors that very rarely return. I even studied a pamphlet from 1703 that argues for the communion of swallows that they gather in the wetlands and follow a specific choreography to perch on top of the rushes until they sink. They spend winters underwater in the hypnotic calm of the muck, and that's why they emerge so climb damp in spring. But in 1822, I carefully attached the photograph, an arrow pierced the neck of a stork in Central Africa, and the bird began its flight bearing both weapon and wound. When it reached Germany, Someone identified the origin of the projectile and went on to form a scientific hypothesis. I don't remember much more of the letter except pain and brightness are distributed in equal parts and lightness only exists because of past excess. Since it's the migratory season, I concluded, I hope you won't mind if I bypass the formula for, well, for farewells. Atlantic in between us, every anemone is fluttering with the currents. Now, thank you. Hey, well, that was really beautiful, everyone. I'm so, I feel, you know, emotional about it um, because I'm also just so proud to have been able to include your work in, um, in the Riveter. And uh, I, of course, am a translator from Spanish, um, the hegemonic language here in the room. And so I want to spend a little time before I, I do a short reading I'd actually like to talk a little bit about our editorial process um, in, in publishing this, uh, this issue of The Riveter. And I'm so happy to uh, see here in the room West Camel, who is the editor of the issue. Uh, I was guest editor and Alice Banks, who's up there in the back is a Spanish translator, also lives in Madrid and was the editorial assistant, but did so much more uh, 
uh, really wonderful editorial work and writing in the magazine that I don't, editorial assistant doesn't even cover it in my mind. Um, yes, and, and one thing I wanted to say too, um, that I think is interesting about this, this issue and uh, about doing, doing the Spanish Riveter like almost makes me feel shaky to say it because we were so conscious and so aware of the importance of Spain as a multilingual and, a, and, and, a, and the linguistic as a multilingual country and the linguistic diversity that I thought, oh my God, as a Spanish translator, how am I ever going to help guide us to get this right? And we had incredible support um, in terms of funding from, from the various uh, cultural institutes of, of, the, of the regions and the languages. And we just wanted to do justice to that trust in us. Um, so I, I, I hope we did, and I think we did. And I wanted to say one um, little bit about the, the unpublished samples that you'll see in here. So uh, in the issue, we have a, a, spot, a Catalan spotlight, a Galician spotlight, and, um, and a bath spotlight. And we do have a wonderful essay by Robin on translating, on finding and translating Asturian literature and a poem that, um, a, a poem translated from the Asturian as well. Um, and in each of those spotlights, we included at least three to four um, extracts of unpublished uh, translations directly from Castilian, sorry, Catalan, Basque, and, and Galician. And it was really important to us when we were including those unpublished extracts in English and recommending them for uh, translation and publication by, by Anglophone um, presses. It was so critical to us that we found that we sourced those samples direct as direct translations from the original language. And uh, many of those we found, um, Alice was great in, in seeking them out. Um, a lot of, most of our Castilian uh, samples came through the ACE um, samples that were, that were funded in that program because we also wanted to make sure that we were including extracts um, for which translators had been paid already because we could not pay them. <laughs> so we made sure that they were extracts that were already um, in existence and that the work had been paid, that the translators had been paid for their work. And then in terms of the other samples, we were really reliant on um, Jacob, uh, Aritz, and, and Mara in terms of being uh, the people that could find, um, in some cases, translated the samples themselves and in other cases introduced them for us. Um, and so just wanted to highlight the, the I guess the, the really multi-purpose and critical role that translators do play in, um, in, in curating as well, uh, the availability of, of these literatures um, in, in English translation. So if, kudos to all of you um, and kudos to the Elnet and Riveter teams for, for hopefully um, producing something that will have a, a, long, a long life and will hopefully be, a, be the source of, of more translations um, in these languages. So um, that was my Riveter guest editor hat. Uh, now I'll talk a little bit about my work as a translator from Spanish and I'll read something, something rather short. But um, I'm currently, I live in Valencia. I'm from New Hampshire um, in the US. And I, uh, my first translation was published about three years ago, Sarah Mesa's Four by Four. So I came rather late to translation, um, literary translation in my, in my own professional life thus far. And it's been like very, very busy <laughs> couple of years since then. Um, so I'm actually not seeking a publisher for anything right now because I have plenty of work lined up, um, which which is a great uh, which is a great privilege and uh, and I'm very lucky to to say that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about other opportunities for people who work <laughs> as translators and who um, had the idea that they thought maybe they wanted to be a full time freelance translator like I did, and then who are now finding themselves actually in that role and thinking, oh, well, what else maybe should I do instead? Um, so I, I've been, I just want to mention a few things in terms of collaborative efforts, which I think is, speaks a little bit to Mara's point about the alchemy and what's happening in this room. And I think what happens in the translation community in general. 
Um, and I just want to point out that on a personal level, I've had really wonderful um, opportunities and interactions with the translators that are here on the stage, and also many of you who are, are just in this room in the audience. Um, and I think that from my perspective, the more that we provide opportunities for each other and make those connections, the better off that we that we all are. And I'm happy the Riveter is a part of that. Um, I am working on slowly but surely on, on getting together um, a translation retreat space myself outside of Valencia. So if you are a literary translator and are interested, you should let me know. I actually had my first two guinea pigs. They're in this room. Robin Munby worked on his beautiful talk out at my Casita mm -hmm. and Jerry Dunn, who's in the back, a great Spanish translator of Cristina Morales and others also featured in the Riveter, um, was also there. So I think just speaking to, uh, there's so much goodwill and we've talked about the diversity, we've talked about there, there is a political dimension. There's also, I don't want to say, comp it is a, co a competition, I suppose, for resources, just in a really practical and bureaucratic way. But what I would want the audience to leave with today is that while there is always a complexity of, of healthy tension, I think in many cases, um, and a fruitful tension in Spain and among the languages of, of, of what, are, what Spain's artistic, uh, artistic environment really can be, is it is so fruitful because of the work that um, that translators do, and also the cultural organizations that are here supporting supporting that work. So there's, I think of it's not like a perfectly rosy picture all the time, but there is on an on an individual level, incredibly goodwill um, and support for the work that we all do, and that's what I would want from my perspective. The big takeaway to be um, because that presents a lot of opportunity for future collaboration, and again. Um, you know, supporting our colleagues as they as they forge new paths, like Robin is, um, and so I'm just really proud to be a part of that. Um, like I said, I don't really I don't really want any more translations <laughs> to be picked up right now. But there is some there is something I want to read, um, which speaks a little bit to a point that I know I made that might have gone almost unnoticed when she was talking about the um, the translation grants available uh, through through ACE and that is that those grants are open to um, writers published writers um, who are they can be Spanish residents as well so we're, they don't actually have to necessarily have been born in the territory of Spain and so as long as they are you know a legal Spanish resident as well um, they they would be eligible and so I'm going to read um, a short sample from um, a, a writer from Argentina. Her name is Florencia del Campo. And she was actually included in um, Spain's uh, AFID, which is like their, like, a, oh my gosh, I'm gonna totally blank on what they, what how I would translate that. But basically like an international cooperation and development organization. Um, also De Camino a Frankfurt did a, um, a series of three, anthologies of 10 writers each. So there were 30 writers who were in their 30s, so in the decade of their 30s, um, 30 young writers. Um, and I had the fortune of doing a lot of those samples. And also Mara's in there as well. And I think maybe Jacob and no, okay, Jacob's not in there. So, um, but he could have been, should have been. Uh, so anyway, um, Florencia was included as an Argentine writer in this a uh, grouping of, of, of 30 Spanish writers. Um, and she has lived in Spain and for, for quite some time. So she wrote a beautiful book called Madre Mía. It was published in 2017 by Caballo de Troya and was edited by um, one of my favorite authors and someone I translate, Laura Moreno, who's a really, really beautiful um, uh, prose writer as well as a, uh, as a poet. And so she edited um, this book. So uh, in Madre Mía, uh, Florencia, uh, the narrator is, um, has left Buenos Aires. She's like, doesn't, she's done. 
with with Argentina and she is like a young woman sort of experiencing uh, the, the wider world and finding her place. She has a complicated relationship with her mother and her sisters back in Argentina. And um, it turns out that uh, just as she is like taking flight in her life and finding her way in a new country, her mom is, is dying of cancer. And the book really goes through um, like sort of what are those, oblig what obligations, what moral obligations do we have um, to our parents and their care? Um, and what moral obligations do we have to ourselves um, as we make our own way in life? So I'm gonna read just a little bit from, from this. Okay, let's see. And it got mixed up, let's see. All right. So um, in an email with a friend, she, um, is asking about this very this very moral question. All right, July 2013, one year after that raw winter, starved sunlight, train tracks on skins, steamed bodies, interest in the moral question. I asked my friend R for her opinion on whether I had to go see you before you died. I wanted her to give me her perspective rooted principally in the moral aspects. She was firm. She termed my absence, quote, deliberate and said it was very likely to cause a rift with my sisters. She referred to me as, quote, nomadic and argued, including herself in this category, that, quote, people like us are selfish out of necessity. She agreed that I should cultivate my independence, but suspected that I would feel really awful later. She encouraged me to make the decision that would cause me the least pain while pointing out that a certain amount of chafing was inevitable when dealing with family. All you can do is try to minimize the damage, she added. She claimed that in the end, what is ethical always comes down to our private lives and that this was natural. She wanted to make a clear distinction regarding that guilt of responsibility. And she said, you aren't guilty of anything, but you feel responsible for being far away. I morally support you in everything you do, she added. I've never loved you more than I do now. What I wanted to know, do we daughters and sons have the moral obligation to care for our parents when they get sick or do we have a choice? based on our feelings, our history, the circumstances. I understood then that the question I posed couldn't be separated from the individual, from my specific situation. And moreover, regardless of what my friend replied, the truth was that it would always have something to do with costs and consequences. I feared there was no answer because maybe there wasn't even a question that could transcend the particularities of my case and allow me to actually talk about this. One month after the moral question, August 17th, 2013, I took a flight to Buenos Aires with layovers in Munich and Frankfurt. I arrived the morning of Sunday, August 18th. I went to see you in the afternoon. You'd been turned into a jellyfish, your wedding band a tourniquet. You didn't look at me or speak. You no longer opened your eyes. You weren't conscious. I said hello and told you I was there. I'd come, nothing. The silence of neat tide, dead calm, madre mia, sea life, mama muerta. I went to sleep at my sister M's. The next day was a bank holiday and I'd, been, and I'd be on duty with you day and night. On the way from your place to M's, I walked through a fair in Plaza Irlanda, the park halfway between your houses. It was an ethnic themed fair. There was food from different countries and typical souvenirs and indigenous type wares. I felt at peace, liberated, a decision had been made. Something was happening almost by itself. The motion of a tide turned to wake. On the morning of Monday the 19th, I went to your house I took care of you early, then S came over, and at dinner time we ordered takeout, asado, french fries, and empanadas. It was unusually warm. We brought the table out to the patio so we could eat outside. The heat was unreal for August in Buenos Aires. Impossible, the stuff of fiction. And at midnight on the dot, like an after-dinner toast, we had to give you your medicine, orally, with a syringe. You had trouble swallowing. My sister M and S were already gone. L said she would help, you give, she would help give you the three treatments. I administered the first. It wouldn't go down. We had to massage your trachea to shift the liquid. You couldn't do anything by then. L tried to lift your torso in hopes that a more upright position would help you swallow. And off and on, I massaged your trachea. You were so heavy that day, almost impossible for us to move. We couldn't get the pain medication into you. It must have been terrible. We were sweating. We rolled up our sleeves, pushed you from behind, and pulled on your arms, stacked pillows behind your back to prop you up turned the crank on the hospital bed many, many times. You started making a weird sound, liquid in the throat. 
We were afraid you hadn't swallowed any of the medication. You were bubbling. Elle was really upset. She was afraid you were in pain. And I started thinking that somehow the sound would eventually have to stop. Almost 15 minutes went by. You were still making the sound. It was getting worse. We were exhausted. We wrestled with your body, jellyfish, slug. And suddenly I thought of F on the thought of being unable to rely on your body. And I knew then exactly what was happening. The sound was deafening. I saw as if in a vision that only a hole in your trachea would stop the gurgle. I looked at my sister and said, call an ambulance, go. She ran to get the phone. I sheared my eyelids shut and puckered my lips, three asterisks on my face. They're sending one, she said when she came back. She thought it might take more than an hour. I looked at her, she looked at me. She wanted to say, she wanted me to say something, but she didn't dare ask. A windless cloud hovered and in the distance, mother thunder. I grabbed her arm, let's wait outside. Thank you. Uh, wow. She wasn't very happy. I mean, I don't know. something maybe a little lighter, but I thought we all go home and have your mothers. I suppose you will agree with me that it's been great to have the opportunity to listen to these translations and to some of the original languages as well. Mm -hmm. And we are very lucky to have two of the authors in the audience as well. Um, so, well, should we just say thank you again? And thank you for being on time. So it's six o'clock now. Um, I suggest we have another 10 minute break before we come back here and we've got 50 minutes for a discussion. And then there will be a wine reception from 7 p.m. Um, so please stay. Uh, right, okay, so <laughs> stay for the wine reception, yeah. Um, right, so see you in 10 minutes and keep thinking about all the questions you want to ask them. Thank you. Sorry, Rita. Uh, yeah. yeah. So let's, uh, yeah, we will have time afterwards, I mean, in the one reception to catch up with things, to talk about new projects, new ideas, everything. But just for now, um, it would be great to, well, um, give you the opportunity to all of you in the audience and also to those of, uh, of you following this event um, online to ask any questions to the five translators, or perhaps if you have any questions for Tina, for Rossi, for Ainoa, or for myself, you can also ask us. Um, yeah, as I said, there will be time for an informal networking um, during the wine, the wine reception. Um, so, have you had time to think about questions? Comments. Or comments? Complaints. <laughs> Is there anything else you would like to know? Yeah. More of an observation listening to the translators. Um, I was reflecting on my experience as a writer and noticing the amount of unpaid labor that underpins the entire publishing industry from editors, writers, and translators. And the lady from Brooklyn, whose name I can't remember, um, she added to that observation that the translators are often doing unpaid legwork of discovering the literature yeah. and the writers. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would like to comment on that. Yeah. Uh, well, we were talking about this in the podcast, and um, I am uh, involved also with the American Literary Translators Association, and last um, November, they organized a professional development day with our with our mentees, and um, they said, okay, we want to put you on a pitching panel, which is like pitching translations to editors, and I said, okay, but you know what I'm going to say, don't pitch, because you'll go broke and your children will start and <laughs> it's not a good look. You know? um, and so if I I went through my whole uh, shtick and, and I said, but I did have one recently uh, good 
experience. I, I pitched a book that I love to an editor that I really wanted to work with, and then he bought it. And I did the book, and it was done really well. And, and there was a the the um, the New York um, head of the Institute Ramon Yul was in the audience, and after what she said to me, Mara, you forget that after you pitched that book and he bought it. He asked you to do a beauty parade, which is what we call when they ask several translators to do the same sample so that they can compare them. And I said, Oh my God, I blocked that out because I, after I won it, I blocked it all out. But um, so you can do all that work and not even get the translation. Um, as you know, we probably have to happen to. I think it's happened to me. That was a time. That was a time problem. I guess. I mean, just in line with what you're saying, too. You know, it is interesting. Like, uh, if you talk to I think translators from languages that have better established systems, especially in terms of outward projection. Um, often there you're hearing about how they, a publisher bought the rights to a book and then they were contacted by the publisher to translate the book. And that, that just feels like such a dream because that's really ideal. You know, ideally you will also like the book, but like, because that doesn't really happen in Galician and you're having to bring the work out there, there's this also hidden labor that I never and probably should start thinking of as work is the many, many, many books that I read in Galician just to know what's yeah. going on. And because there's no other, like, I I have to know what's happening because no one else, you know, is going to be doing that work otherwise. And that's that, that will always be unpaid. And there's nothing to do about that per se. But I think that's another part. It's like having the people, having agents is really helpful in that way where they can at least do some of that like work um, so that I can have my life a little bit more. I would also say that as a translator, if you don't have that curiosity to read all that stuff, then you're probably in the wrong game. I would probably read less. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you also need to read in English quite extensively to be able to translate well. And yeah. sometimes there's that balance that can that can be problematic when you yeah. yeah. listen a lot in English as well. Yeah. yeah. And different Englishes these yeah. whole Scottish. <laughs> well, and the thing you've just read from us, me. I drew, I drew on a lot of life experiences uh, to, to put that translation together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, yeah, I just, uh, sorry, just sounds so my back to you, but um, I, there are two things actually in response to what you said, because I think if we all had longer, we would have spoken at much greater length of what we think can be done. One of them is, you mentioned agents as well. Now, a lot of what we do is acting as agents because they don't exist. And um, they don't exist enough for the work we do and the work the translators do. And, and the work of some of the presses, you know, people, people can't afford them and they can't afford publicity. So we end up doing all these things. But I don't think, I think we should, you know, we've, we've been brought up, many of us, to believe that you go to a job and it's a nine to five job. And that's what our parents did and my parents were both teachers. And it, we can't think like that about work anymore. What we do, we do, we all love what we do. It gives us enormous benefits, not just, you know, intellectually, but culturally and mentally and spiritually and all those wonderful areas. I know that we should all be better paid. We all believe in that. But I do think that we're having to think about work in a different way. We can't monetize everything we do. And that's, you know, certainly you have to read a lot in Galician. What a joy. You know, as long as you get. And it's, I can't tell you what a joy it has been working on these two magazines. Yeah. We worked hard. Yes, we have done. But, um, and we, you know, we do all do other jobs. And I know we all work too hard. But, um, you know, it is it is a different way of working yeah. if we're in this business. It really is different. I, I think that I do agree in general. I think that there's a tension between the, the shifting nature of the way we work and the fact that even if I don't, I, I'm not, that's what I'm saying. I don't expect my reading to ever become monetized, but our life externally is monetized for us. We have to pay rent, yeah. et cetera. The only reason yeah. that I, I will be completely frank, the only reason I'm able to 
spend as much time reading as I do is because I live in affordable government housing and my partner is a teacher, which in America also means that I have free health care. You know, so we so have a similar kind of, you know, we don't have a mortgage, so I don't have to sort of that's, that's, where, mortgage, that's where you run into the problem where it shouldn't be just that the people who have these sort of not it's it's the rare few that even have that economic situation yeah. that we're sort of limiting ourselves to when so much of it is and we couldn't do it if we didn't have it. Right, exactly, exactly. Okay. And yeah. that's yeah. why there's a lack of diversity in literary translation, which is a naturally diverse field or should be. Yeah. Um, but it so on the other hand, one of the wonderful things about translation and working with literature um, is that you're always learning. Uh, and that's not something you can say about every job. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every time I, every day I think I've Finally figured out how to translate. I finally know how the book publishing industry works. And the next day, the, the weight of reality just comes crashing down. Thirty days. So yeah. yeah. I, sometimes, I sometimes think that it's a bit like being a farmer on your own farm. Okay, so there's always work to do. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you think, well, is, it, is this actually work or is it just by way of life? Yeah. Subsistence yeah. translation. Subsistence yeah. translation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Filling the keyboard feels like a sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> At least as a farmer, though, you wouldn't be so sedentary. Actually, <laughs> yes, we should claim the physio or something. Back massage. Grab a laptop. You do um, grants for back massage. Sure. Yeah. I'm thinking about that. Today is the brain massage. I mean, the opportunity to do what we are doing right now and the joy of sharing yeah. what has been said. I think um, this is the massage in the way that nothing else. I can actually do real massage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can. You can try. Okay. <laughs> you can line up later. <laughs> Do we want to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, no, I just, I, I, I don't have massage friends yet, but, but I was thinking that we just came up with something I forgot to mention, and, uh, no, but we do have uh, a new line in the fifth day program, which is uh, residences, and mm -hmm. residences goes, um, ever since we, I, we started out with uh, the literature line, in my area, uh, Authors, translators, illustrators have the, they're all considered authors in the same level. So you could apply as translators to a uh, residency in, uh, in Spain so far. So yeah. that's something, sorry, I forgot to mention the first. That's mm -hmm. it's, for it's residencies a, that, in, in, that include translators as writers, yes. which are actually, which include translators yeah. as authors. Not, yeah. 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 Do you want to? Do we have any other questions online? Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. So we, yeah, exactly. We've got a question um, for all the translators who did such a beautiful job of capturing the voice voices of the original texts. How do you approach finding and then uh, transmitting those vibrant characters and narrators' voices into English? How do you approach that? Um, yeah, so that I guess the story that I read in particular um, is very oral and has a lot of dialogue. Um, and to some extent, the voice, the voice that I use in that translation is is kind of the natural place that I go to when I'm uh, kind of picturing that dialogue in my. Um, in my own kind of head as I'm writing, but it wasn't really until I read it aloud that mm -hmm. I felt that I had found like the right voice um, for it. Um, and in fact, on a similar note, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but just in the break now, um, I was talking about the use of, of regional accents and dialects mm -hmm. in uh, translation. Um, and, you know, it's a very, it's an interesting subject and it's also something that is you know, regional accents but within the UK context, particularly, I think there's awareness about the use of dialects in translation because often 
uh, regional dialects are just used as a very, very basic class signifier within the translation. Um, and also another conversation that I was having during the break is that there aren't a great deal of translators from, for example, the north of England. I don't personally know of any other literary translators from Liverpool where I'm from. Um, and I don't think that's coincidental. I think that's partly to do with some of the things that we've just been talking about. You know, I personally am from uh, a very middle class, quite a privileged background. Um, so again, I don't think it's that surprising that I'm the translator from Liverpool that's on panels like this. Mm. Um, and so it's uh, that's, you know, that's one of the reasons that I always put mine from Liverpool right at the start of my bio whenever I do something like this, because hopefully someone else might see it. Um, and I always say I'm from Cornwall, yeah. and I went to a comprehensive yeah. school, you know, so just to keep it open. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think it's, you know, this is just happens to be, you know, a, a resource that I have to draw on, and sometimes it feels right to, and sometimes it doesn't like for that particular story, you know. Making the characters a bit scouse just felt so like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like, yeah. To, to the original setting. Uh, to the original setting, yeah. Right. After the, yeah. Yeah. After so the, after be the translation was before the reading. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so before we take uh, your question, Olivia, would any other translators would like to uh, yeah, compliment? For me, it's quite intuitive at first, at least. So it's trying to find voice and that's quite intuitive afterwards. And there will be lots of. Um, modifications to it perhaps but really it's quite a short. Yes, that's I'm I'm actually trying to write an analysis of how I translate as part of the PhD and it's very difficult. I started trying to translate by hand so that I could slow it down because of course I spent decades just trying to translate faster. Um, <laughs> My kids need in their shoes. Um, and, and so, yeah, and, it, and you do want it to become intuitive, but then it, I also want to give a shout out to editors because mm -hmm. yeah. they make what we do possible because we, we need that feedback. So that's yeah. another uh, really important part of the ecosystem. And yeah. of course, line editors and, you know, everyone, everyone involved, but there's a... And also they're some of the greatest champions of translated literature i mean they the same the kinds of you know and, and hopefully they're writing the grants yeah <laughs> so right. we don't have to right so yeah yeah Laura, I, I would love to just hear a tiny bit about how you how you translated orbi how do you how did you come up with that voice well it as i say there were a lot of different i strangely enough when i was in my early 20s <laughs> I worked as the amanuensis of a 16th century historian who, uh, one of the world experts on Bartolomé de las Casas. Um, it, so, and then I used to work in Chicano theater. So I drew on, uh, I used I used a Spanglish from Miami um, instead of a California one, which is more my um, milieu. <laughs> But so there, I and luckily the book is so anachronistic and yeah. crazy that you know it it leaves a lot of room yeah. for you to to solve things in your own way. Yeah. And I and I worked closely with Max because it, while he didn't have the answers for me, I had to make sure I understood what the questions were before I answered them myself. And he was great because he would always say, "These are your problems." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah. But I so you know once you once you know what their intent is, is, then you just have to kind of take take a leap yeah. with it. Mm -hmm. Take up, is there anything else you would like to tell us also about the encounter with the characters of the memoir? His mother only spoke to me in English. <laughs> um, I think I was, I sort of blacked out when it happened. I, was, <laughs> I just felt very, where did they get you know, like, <laughs> Ah, do I, they do feel like characters a little bit, so now I have to be confronted with their reality. Uh, no, it, it was it was really nice though, and you can tell how proud they are also just of, of the book being out there and how, how excited the thought of it being in English also makes them. Um, and his aunt recommended me some pastries and other such things. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but it's, I mean, we've talked about Spanish as a hegemonic language, but of course English, especially in the public and world, mm -hmm. in the publishing world. Public as well. <laughs> um, it is very much the hegemonic language, 
for good and for bad. I mean, as translators into English, we have a lot of power compared to these small languages and a lot of responsibility. But it can... well, I think in this case, just because of the yes, but because of the particularities of like growing up in London and wanting to see the book in English. Yeah, yeah. No, I will. It's with Catalan authors that I developed a way of working that's much more collaborative um, in terms of asking questions and some sometimes you know sometimes the answer is I don't know it just came out that way I mean writers also work very intuitively or mm -hmm. that's something they used to say in my bola you know or my grandmother used to say that I didn't I don't know what it means but the, um, but there you know negative results are still results. That's what the historian used to say to me. Uh, I still remember. <laughs> um, but there's, yeah, it's a it's a special relationship I think that that can be built, and and English can lead to a lot of other translations. These sample translations can be read all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, to say for good and for bad, but often for good. Also, for, I, I actually should probably mention, which I, I should have mentioned this during my talk. But the fact that I even have a sample of this book was funded by an Ate sample grant, mm -hmm. and thanks to the agent Ella Sharon who was here earlier, so mm -hmm. gave me the time and space to. Because it took me a long time to find the voice. Actually, I, I had written or I had translated down a few drafts, and I was rereading it, and I thought this is horrible. <laughs> and then I, then I was like, but I know it's not horrible. So I read these. You know, I was reading the original again. I was like, that's right, it's not horrible. Why is my horror? <laughs> so then I had, I really had to do a lot of. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it. links to the question as well. I mean, if you had had to do that uh, on your free time sure. without that sample, that would be unpaid yeah. labor. Yeah. And in this sense, it could at least you get paid yeah. for doing that. And let's see where that takes you and the book. <laughs> right. There was a question up there. Yes, I did have a question. Um, what I was first going to say was in response to what Robin was saying, uh, and I just thought, well, I really enjoyed all of the readings, um, but I really noted like some of those bold dialogue choices. And as someone from Sheffield, I really appreciate hearing a character saying, he's going in for a tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to hear that. Very interesting. Um, but my question was, uh, we're talking about interactions with cultural institutions and support systems and networks. And I wondered if any of you had had an experience where you might uphold that as a model experience. Like, has there been a time where everything has worked for you and you felt like, yes, the system in this case has supported me and enabled me to achieve the outcome that I wanted? Has anybody had that? Something <laughs> close. This is maybe a very literal or maybe very uh, present <laughs> example of that, but uh, essentially the fact that I am, uh, the fact that I'm here doing this event, the fact that I did a panel yesterday at uh, London Book Fair uh, was through the support of the uh, Astorian regional governments. Uh, the fact that I got even got in touch with them in the first place and that that, that interaction happened was to do with the fact that Asturias had a stand at the Frankfurt Book Fair, which kind of shows the importance of uh, what Olga was talking about before. You know, that was really how uh, I made a connection with Olga, how I made a connection with uh, also various people within Asturias. Uh, it was the first time I met Laura was at the Frankfurt Book Fair as well. Um, and that's led to this, and that's led to this opportunity to uh, showcase a story. Also, you know, um, this event is also being funded by Action Cultural, which is great, um, and that support is very important for what's happening now. At the same time, um, it's notable that the, the support that uh, personally I've received from the Asturian regional governments, uh, and at the same time, this disjuncture where you know, like we've been talking about a lot of the grants that are available at a national level in Spain, um, and I know that, that there is an awful lot of goodwill and good intention and a real desire from uh, the Spanish Ministry of Culture and Acción Cultural and other national level organisations um, to support Astorian. The Instituto Cervantes has just signed an agreement with the Astorian uh, regional government to support Astorian literature, but it remains the case that Astorian is eligible for none of the translation grants out of uh, 
into languages outside of Spain. So none of the grants provided by the Fund Cultural or the Ministry of Culture, uh, Asturian writing cannot receive any of those grants. And that's not, this isn't an active decision, you know, by no means that somebody has decided that we're not going to let. It's all to do with the way that the Lenguas Oficiales, the official languages of Spain, and that framework is baked into so much funding in terms of translation and and at an historical time. At a historical time, and I, and I completely understand why that is. But what I would like to see this is a bit perhaps utopian thinking that anyone's going to listen to me about this in the Ministry of the Cultura. But since they do want to support diverse yeah. multilingualism in Spain, you know, to, to think of ways that grants could be written outside of the framework of official languages. We yeah. talked a bit about the use of residency in Spain as a criteria for awarding grants, because I also think, okay, Asturian might become an official language, that's something that could happen in the near future, but then what happens with Aragonés, what happens with the other languages of Spain, because there are more, it just passes the, the you know, passes the can down the road, um, and I also think, of, you know, what I would like to see, ideally, is, you know, that a, a writer in uh, Sevilla writing in Spanish, and a writer in Mieres writing in Asturian and, for example, uh, a Senegalese person resident in La Lafayette in Madrid yeah. who was writing in Wolof or in French, all had, because that's all, that's all literature of Spain, yeah. you know, are there ways that we can think outside of this, like, framework and design things that are more, kind of, broadly inclusive of, like, linguistic diversity, you know, in a just a much broader sense. Uh, maybe that's a very, very big question to raise. But just something to yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, something that I should say is that because I, I'm just a lowly translator, I'm not attached to any institutions. I've never published a book in English. So I, I can say this stuff, hopefully, and people might listen, and people who are embedded into institutions where they have, you know, a lot more things to deal with and a lot of people telling them no, which I don't have. Guess Maybe what? we'll listen People and think about these things. You. You know, um, you're such a great and eloquent you know, um, translator of these big thoughts. Well, because I'm somewhat untethered, I feel like. <laughs> like I don't say this then. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Any other yeah, good yeah. experiences? I would, of course, uh, want to give a shout out to the Institute Ramon Yul, which I sort of feel like we grew up together because they're 20 years old and that's about how long I've been working with Catalan. Um, and they fund pretty much everything I do, uh, usually not directly through me. Sometimes I'll hit them up for something, but <laughs> in, including the PhD that I'm doing, I mean, in, in, in every possible way. But I also want to acknowledge um, the fact that Spain has four official languages is already really amazing. I mean, yeah. the, look at the status of Catalan in France. Yeah. Um, so I just do want to acknowledge that yeah. as much as sure. can be improved. It's a, it's a great starting point um, compared to Italy or France, just to yeah. name it. Yeah. Or, or even here. I mean, the Welsh are pretty much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess the best. The National Endowment for the Arts has translation grants, which are far and away provide the most money of any grants that I've seen by themselves, but they are only open to American citizens and permanent residents. And I, if they would change that, I think that it would really change. They don't even get that many applications every year. It's kind of a crazy thing. Um, and I think that if they would open that, like it gives you, like the Pat Heim grants are also really great, which come from Pat America. But unless you're doing a book of maybe 20,000 words, they don't even fund you close to an entire translation. Whereas NEA, you know, if we're talking 15000 to $20,000, it's just in one fell swoop. Um, and I guess the important thing there is if you're a resident in that country, that, that payment is something that meets your, your living costs as well. And one of the issues sometimes is working with institutions that are not in the country in which you live, those rates don't often match. Sure. The, the costs that yeah. you need to make a living. So, but I, just also in terms of the way that they operate, I I've never worked with a sort of a at least in America where you're asking questions about how the application process. I have found them to be so open and helpful and sort of like here's a question, here's like a concrete answer, not a sort of 
which is not always the case. It depends on your your exam scores. You sometimes you find to get um, students, although they are open translators from that regard. So that is what you're saying. Hen Heim. It's named after Michael Henry Heim, um, a famous translator of I think like nine different languages. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone has to have one. <laughs> um, so I think I can't remember if it was after his death where it's like they, they had it. H E Y M. H E I M. H E I M. I think he actually. It's an endowment essentially yeah. that he created. That just, he created. And they just use so 13, 12 mm -hmm. to 13 translations every year from poetry or prose. And lately they're doing a, a very good job of providing linguistic and national diversity in terms of the, the places that they're um, awarding the grants to. And I think applications are open until like June oh, 15th. Oh, until June 1st. Yeah, June 15th. June, yeah yes. so the application deadline for the Penheim is, is June, June, 2nd. June 2nd. So we've got, we're just crowdsourcing here. Uh, we have the it's the nice to three Americans. Yeah. We have a real mix. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, you were. Um, though he, I'm recovering from a traumatic brain injury, so but you with the dyslexia, there's a little lay between the brain and the spoken word. Um, but I'm gonna read my question. First of all, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is actually the first event that I've attended since I had a major accident in 2017, and uh, I chose right. Well, welcome. Uh, Thank you to myself, and uh, and we 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 just ignore how important the brain is um, for everything that we do. Mm -hmm. So it's taking me six years of continuous rehabilitation to be able to be here today. And I want to thank you really because of what you do is so important, especially in a changing world where, as you said, you know um, there's a, a language that become extinct every fortnight so we have to protect languages mm -hmm. you know um so thank you very much uh, and this is my question um bear with me uh, i'm gonna remove my mask literary translations are not just about language literary translations are also works about the culture uh, that parallel world of the culture of the source language. Um, it's a big commitment. Um, what do you do, each one of you, you know, to immerse yourselves in the culture, in the world of the authors, their works, and their cultures? Thank you. Thank you for that great question and thank you for being here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't believe that I'm here. I couldn't walk or talk, you know, so. Thank you for the email. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. So very happy you spoke. I have a chat with you because I spoke to a friend of yours today. Yeah. He says he really didn't want to draw attention to you. He's okay. very brave. That's a brilliant question. Yeah. Wow. But this is not about me. So please. No, no, no. It's a great question. Okay, yeah. shall I go first? Sure. Um, I moved to the Basque country after meeting a Basque uh, lady who told me about the Basque, the Basque grammar system, the grammar system specifically, <laughs> and I fell in love. So, <laughs> with both, <laughs> and I should say that the lady and I are, are very, very good friends. So, there are most of us that are very, very good friends, and I'm still absolutely in love with us, Grammar. So, that's why I moved in to that country. And uh, then, to uh, answer your question specifically, I, after um, learning quite a lot of language, language acquisition is a lifelong thing anyway, in our own languages as well, but after learning enough to start translating, which is something I've done before with other, other languages, um, really, I suppose, um, I, because it's a small language community, you have the opportunity to meet uh, writers and uh, artists, creators of all sorts of uh, uh, disciplines. And I had this opportunity some years ago to found Bookingy, which is uh, which publishes books by authors and sports. So and we do events and so on. And I live there, and uh, I live in a Basque speaking town. All my friends are Basque, so I use it's a language I use for play and for work and for everything in between. And so I'm, you know, very lucky. And so maybe one of the questions uh, we were talking about alone is how you keep your in my case, how I hold on to my English. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, 
watch a lot of television. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously I read, talk with my friends and my family here, but for me, listening uh, or watching television, the, the, the spoken word is very, very important. I think uh, the, the written word is easier to hold on to, but the spoken word, which changes so often, the expressions and so on, that's, uh, so that's, that's my answer to you. And thank you very much for that question. Um, I'll just kind of piggyback on that briefly about the the reading and the and the listening in English because I think we've mentioned you know just the lack of time in terms of how much maybe we would like to read. Um, and I've been listening to audiobooks like like fanatically for the last couple of years in English while I do anything that doesn't you know require me um, to be kind of paying attention to something else. And that's been a way of keeping sort of my English fresh as well, and paying attention, of course, to the rhythm of the language, which is so which is so important when you're trying to produce a you know um, an enjoyable translation for someone else to read. Um, I also live in Spain, so I think separately almost Jacob's the only one who lives. Yeah, you're also the only one who ever, you know, got knocked out of a translation competition. Maybe you know. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the, you know, the immersive experience of living in in Spain, living in Valencia, um, I know for me that that, you know, that made a gigantic difference in how I was able to develop my translation career, which has been quite short. I'm just three years old now, and it coincided with uh, my family and I moving to Spain because I'm a mom of um, two youngish children, and the um, the costs of trying to work part time and freelance and begin a career in translation with young children were completely prohibitive for me in the United States. Like I had nowhere to put my kids. Um, I couldn't pay for them to go to daycare while I like, dabbled in translation. Um, and so actually moving to Spain was what allowed us to uh, be able to, for me to pursue this opportunity and this dream, which was something I really didn't think would be possible. So the conditions, I know we've mentioned that, and I, I do want to make just an extra note of it, that you know, the, our work, where we live and the conditions in which we work do make a difference in terms of uh, making possible sometimes this lifestyle choice, which is being a translator. Um, so, you know, your question might have been more geared towards linguistically or culturally how we immerse ourselves, but um, I find that I, what I most appreciate or what I'm most grateful for is sort of like, you know, the actual material resources to be able to do the work. Um, and that is thanks in large part to um, a much better social uh, network. Um, and social system in Spain than in, than in my country of origin. True of the UK as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I live up in the Northeast, which is, you know, a, 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 the cost of living up there is quite low, really. Mm -hmm. And um, if I had to worry about health care, for example, buying health insurance and all those things, as I, would have, as I did back in the States, um, I wouldn't have been able to, you know, dedicate so much of my professional time mm -hmm. to translation. It just wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I I live in Catalonia. Um and I have for most of the last 20 years. So um yeah there's there's sometimes like a there's like two different me's a mm -hmm. little bit. Um I I notice it most when people come to visit me and I have to I have to hang out with my friends. My friends do speak English, but they don't want to. Uh, and you know, how do you bring those worlds together? And sometimes that happens on the page too, where um, you know, you 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 want to bring something culturally across, and they, there aren't the words for it um, without a footnote. <laughs> that was another great thing about Max's book is that there were already footnotes, so I couldn't have my own when I needed to. But usually that's a kind of a verbatim. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although we do have, or at least I have the chance to put in English in the original. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I mean, one of the main ways I do it is living in New York is by reading a lot, as I was saying, but that's also. Partly thanks to the fact that I'm a bookseller, which means I don't ever pay for books in the U.S. Um, 
Well, I know that sounds horrible. I, I think my literary painter in Chigalicia, and off every you know half, half a year or so, I'll just sort of uh, order a big packet of books from Galicia. Uh, but the residency that I was mentioning that I had in March was was actually really great. If I hadn't been back to Galicia since 2019 and I was able to meet, I, I think I saw Shakespeare just three or four times. He showed me his town. I met with other people who showed me their towns, which is not, a, I, I had lived there for a year, but it was in a sense where I, the context where I was working. So having the residency, I was able to actually just, even though I was also in the translating, um, uh, <laughs> I had more time to sort of go wherever and, and meet people and see more of Galicia than I had seen before. Um, but otherwise, it's mostly reading and the occasional podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so if, if Arendt is like swimming at the bottom of the pool, high level of immersion is like sitting on the edge of the pool and dipping my feet in. So I, I, I'm very new to uh, both Asturian translation and the Asturian language. So I started uh, learning Asturian during the pandemic um, in the kind of like general part of the pandemic, I'd always been interested in uh, multilingualism in Spain. Um, I don't really remember exactly why, but I started reading Astorian literature and like Jacob said, but probably to an even more extreme degree, like that was first and foremost the way uh, that I discovered Astorian uh, culture. Mm. Um, and uh, so, since then, uh, I've had more opportunity to have a more direct <laughs> immersion in Astorian culture. Um, but primarily, it has been through literature. And I, I think it's, again, it's worth pointing out that, you know, the reason I started learning Astorian not too many years ago, and I'm now sitting on a panel as an Astorian translator, is a lot to do with the status of the Astorian language and the fact that there are so few other people um, out there and I think the only thing I can do about that is be aware of what my limitations are and um, keep trying to learn more, uh, go and learn more, understanding which texts, you know, I have a competence to work with and which, you know, there are some books that I really love. Um, there's a book that I read uh, quite recently called La Cama by Vanessa Gutierrez, uh, who's a wonderful uh, Asturian writer and I would love to translate that book at some point. Um, but as I was reading it, I was like, wow, this is really like, I started trying to translate it and I was like, this is hard, I'm yeah. not ready yet. Yeah. So I think just like having that awareness and mm -hmm. um, also at the same time, trying to support the work of the people mm -hmm. who are in Astorius already, um, like Lara, who have translations ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and just kind of like thinking about how I fit into that system. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's, it's a work in progress, let's say that. I like that you said that because uh, you're older and wiser than, than me, I think. You're not, but yeah. uh, no, no, what I mean is when I first started, I, I, I read some books and I was really interested in translation and I absolutely was not ready to be translated. <laughs> and I did it anyway. Jacob is the example that I'm following. In. <laughs> right. We've got 10 minutes, one question from the audience, um, but also a question online, which I think I'm going to do first because it, the, the answer should be yes or no. <laughs> so this is from Lilith Twaits from Melbourne, yeah, uh, who is a translator and the president of the Australian, not Asturian or Austrian, Australian <laughs> Association for Literary Translation. So uh, well, um, the, the question comment is, please, can all of you shakers and movers come out to Australia to help us convince our publishers, festival directors and government funding bodies to support and promote literary translation and to take serious advantage of the sort of grants that Ainoa has spoken about? So yes or no? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let's go to Australia. Put together a road. I mean, yeah. And I know what's in Australia. But I have to say, Lily is actually a wonderful translator. Was was one of those perfect examples. She came to Spain mm -hmm. as a visitor, uh, mm -hmm. as a restricted and visitor program, and has ever been. Uh, she's been the most wonderful ambassador of Spanish literature in Australia after that. So, right. mm -hmm. And Lilith is a contributor to The Riveter with okay. her translation of um, Avro Samantero, 
funded by an ACE sample grant right for carbon ball sound efficiency so okay. yeah so there's so there's that perfect yeah. example yeah. Mm -hmm. so yes we will come right folks could we, could to australia we, could we do this as a worldwide cruise <laughs> right <laughs> yeah are each uh you don't fly so how oh, are we gonna make right. it right. well, a floating residency <laughs> <laughs> That would be great. I think that's a, a really important point, though, that um, you know we're talking about Anglophone, the Anglophone publishing world, and we're, what we're talking about without necessarily explicitly mm -hmm. saying it all the time is the United States and then the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know okay. there. I think there is hmm? okay. Canada. A little bit. <laughs> you're right. No, you're right. You're right. I'm saying, but when we talk, sort of. Yeah. We're in the, right. Yes, Canada. Nobody <laughs> always. Says. Um, million yeah, and and other and other English speaking parts of the world. So I think that is, you know, I don't have any more to say on that. But I think there's a question. But yeah. Keep on mind. Or is it the yeah yeah now Jesus yeah. Um, well, I'd just like to start thanking you as translators for being able to convey our words and our ideas to other languages. Uh, Suppose Laura mm -hmm. agrees that today it was very special for us to be able to uh, listen to our works in your own languages, in your own words, you make them your own. And I can't thank you enough for that. And to be, uh, to be uh, hearing my, what I wrote in Galicia, in English, mm -hmm. that is my mother tongue. Mm -hmm. that I was born here and I learned maiden writing lady but Mm -hmm. But then, uh, for 45 years, it's not been my country. Mm -hmm. So in some time, sometimes I feel like I've been locked out. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find a way in. Mm -hmm. And that way in is your translation. We're all breaking together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In a very special way for me, because that's the literature I've been reading and the music I've been listening to all my life. And it's not, I've not got now the command of English, enough command of English to be an author, but I can also be a translator. Mm -hmm. So I've translated uh, several authors from English into Galician and Spanish. My latest efforts were Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Trade Year into Galician mm -hmm. and Orwell's Animal Farm into Spanish. And one of those authors I've uh, been lucky enough to translate is Julian Bright, mm -hmm. translating two of his novels into English. And now we've got a uh, uh, relation as friends. Mm -hmm. And while I was writing my own book, he was very supportive, uh, giving me advice and telling me not to uh, give in. And by the way, he's uh, offered to write an introduction if the final English person version uh, translation comes out. So publishers, please take notice about that. <laughs> if you want an introduction from but Barnes. When I found, find, found myself locked out was attending Julian Barnes' 70th birthday party that was held in Soho the same week the Brexit referendum was voted, mm. two days before. Yeah. And it was his big table with Julian Barnes, a great British author, but also an European author, with his French publisher, his German, Italian, Dutch, and this humble little Galician translator as well. And for me, it was a very revealing moment because there, there was the whole Europe came together mm. the, at that table. And the host was a very great British. Leicester, Rome, London, both are very British, but also very European and very universal at the same time. And I told him that, uh, I mean, this is the perfect metaphor for what you've done. And I can't believe in two days you're, you're going to vote if you're going to get out of this or not. And he said, don't count your uh, chickens until they're hatched because anything can happen. And then two days later, well, you know what happens. Okay. So sometimes I feel that um, I've got my own immigrant story to tell as a Londoner, just as the immigrants from the West Indies, from the Asian communities. But uh, I find it extra difficult to find a place for that story in the global London immigrant narrative. Mm. So I hope to, it will be the key that can unlock <laughs> that. That's me, and I'm, yeah. I'm really grateful for you.
for you to have translated the example and all the people who have, mm -hmm. who have made it possible and that they have been generous enough and have the vision to uh, do what we are doing today. So many thank you to all. <laughs> On that note, uh, it's uh, yeah. Uh, there is just one quick question as well here, asking about uh, the name or link for the funding map that Rosie mentioned. So is that? Um, they have to, they have to go to the European Union National Institutes of Culture website. Students, right. Okay. Which is the it's the UNIC website. Uh, it's UNIC London. Okay, I'll write it uh, here. <laughs> right, and before, yeah, could I just please remind you if you have a chance to fill out the survey with your insights so that we can carry on doing projects like uh, like this one. Unless there is any last minute question, um, I think we are ready to go to the uh, to have a, well, to the wine reception. We can carry on the conversation there, and thank you again for being here today. Thank you. Thank you.